It being 10 o'clock, we'll start the work session on House Bill 50. So do I have anybody out there that would like to uh, comment, uh, Mike or... Yeah, if you want to take a seat and use your mic, I was reminded by former Chair Umberger that none of us used our mics at the last uh, discussion we had, and nobody could hear us. So if you please use your mics. It'll be great. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Marty Carlin representing the New Hampshire Retirement System. Um, HB 50 is um, fairly straightforward and, and something this committee and both uh, members of the House and Senate have seen in prior years. Uh, this bill would, um, as, as written, uh, have the state pay 7.5% of the local employer contribution costs for uh, its uh, for their uh, teachers, police, and fire members to NHRS. So from NHRS's perspective, this, this bill has no impact on either the unfunded liability or the amount of uh, funds we receive in a given year uh, out of employer contributions. It just simply comes out of a different pocket. Um, one question that um, one of the uh, members on finance asked is, is there any way actuarially to project if this bill were to pass, you know, what salaries, would salaries increase for um, different employers? And that, that that's, there are too many variables in that question to, for the actuary to uh, accurately perform. We do have what's called a payroll growth assumption. Um, and we would assume in a vacuum that, you know, um, you know, the payroll would grow at a steady pace every year. We know that's not the case, but for uh, police and fire, it's 2.75%, 2.25% for teachers. So whatever the amount on the fiscal note, um, you know, for, for next year um, that was put in, that's basically previously con con contributed amounts from fiscal 21 rolled forward at that that those rates of increase. And that, that's how we would see the bill playing out. Obviously, um, salaries are going to differ uh, between communities. Raises are going to be different. Um, that's a percent of covered payroll. So if um, employers were to add staff, that's going to increase payroll, uh, things like that. So there's too many variables to predict what impact on local spending this subsidy would have. This is something that had been in effect uh, since 1977 uh, through um, fiscal uh, 2011. Uh, and uh, I think that's basically, uh, you know, my questions that I wanted to address that, that my colleagues last week didn't have at their fingertips. Marty, could you spell your last name for the clerk? Oh, sure. Yep. K A R L O N is in Nancy. Just a little heads up for those of you that have never been on a division before. <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll take, we can take testimony or if you have questions of someone that may be sitting here, you're free to ask them. What we'll do at the end, we can hold on to the bill, we can pass the bill, we can ITL the bill. Um, what we'll do is be making a recommendation to the full committee. Whoever makes that motion has to write the committee report for the committee. So if you're making the motion, be prepared to write a committee report. Uh, Representative McGuire, I know you have questions on this bill. <laughs> you know me too well. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Carlin, for coming. Um, so this is maybe not so much on the bills per se, but on what you just said. All right. So you just said that your assumptions are that salaries are going to go up by two point something percent, right? Um, but I believe that this committee is as a whole is contemplating state salaries going up more like 5% per year for the next two years uh, for this biennium. And so, so it seems to me you're really underestimating um, 
are those things are those things that you just said likely to change soon? Uh, we we um, when when we talk about our assumptions, including salary growth, um, those those are reviewed uh, and updated as needed in actuarial experience studies, which are conducted every four years. Uh, the next one that we have is in um, it's it close of fiscal twenty three. So. Um, Spring of uh, 24 is when the board will be looking at recommendations from the actuaries and, and it's not so it's not nothing we're looking at, you know, today's rate of inflation and adjusting on the fly. Uh, you know, there are assumptions that um, we hope are reasonable over a longer period. Um, historically, um, our payroll growth assumption has lagged wages over the last decade. We last adjusted, I think we kept it at 275 and 225. No, I think it was three percent and two two and a half uh, the, uh, in the 2019 and before the 2019 experience study. So it's something um, we we look at, but um, you know it, we don't expect it every year that to be a straight line. It's you know over a you know 10 or 20 or 30 year period that you know it's going to average out to something in that range. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to make a ask a related question. So if salaries are accelerating faster than you currently expect. Does that is that have sort of an outsized effect on the unfunded liability, because it because we pay the benefits are related to the top average of the top five years, right? So if we if somebody gets all of a sudden a big raise that that affects their top five years, so so it directly affects benefits, but on the other hand, it doesn't change what we have saved at all right we have a certain yeah. amount saved to pay those benefits right so so it must have a big effect on out on unfunded liability is that correct it, it, it's it's sort of a double-edged sword uh, in the sense that if salaries outpace expectations then projected benefits are based on average final salary on a, on a, on a five-year average for most people who are working right now so you know that has upward pressure on the liability. However, we're also receiving more in contributions than we expected in a given year because the payroll is higher than we expected. So that's money in, money that we're investing now, money that we're paying, putting towards the unfunded liability. So there's a there's a positive and a negative effect, and a lot of it is depends on you know are these across the board increases or these rewarding people closer to retirement or these starting wages that are increasing. There's a, there's a lot of variables to tease out to see ultimately what the impact is, but th there's, there's sort of a double-edged sword with that, you know, a positive and a negative. Members have a representative Griffin. Uh, um, this is similar to the bill that we had last year. And I think it, the amount of money involved was something like $50 million. Uh, there, there was a one-time payment, uh, and I believe it was House Bill 1221 last year, and that, that was an after-the-fact reimbursement of a percentage of fiscal 22 contributions. Yeah. Uh, I, th I thought that ended up being in the 26, 27 million okay. range, and um, I think this this fiscal note is a little bit higher, but it gets rolling forward, projecting a larger covered yeah. payroll. and. If I if I may too, I, I realize there are probably some newer members either on finance or new to retirement issues. So I just wanted to double back. And when we talk about employer contribution rates, I just want to make sure everyone understands our employer rates are set by the actuary, and they're a percentage of of covered payroll. So for all the pensionable wages that the employees and, and other members are earning, the employers are paying a percentage of that to NHRS. The rates are different for the four member groups, employees, teachers, police, and fire. Um, so, you know, there, there are, so it's, it's a percentage of the total payroll. Yes, sir. So that, that leads me to a question. Um, we know now, based on uh, the last bill, how much money was involved. Has anyone analyzed that money to see if uh, if uh, what what the distribution would be by town if the state, in place of a bill like this, just were to take that twenty seven million dollars and give it to the towns across the board based on population? And I'd I'd like to see the figures that would 
would result because I suspect what's happening here is that the small towns are subsidizing the large cities. I may be wrong, I haven't seen the figures, but that's my, my, my gut feel is that uh, I live in a town that has very few full-time employees, so the retirement pay, what they pay into the retirement is, is probably less per capita than a big city does. So I'm kind of interested to see those figures. Are those available? Uh, we can we can pull together and, and share the um, the town by town and school school districts what they received under uh, HB 1221 last year. Again, it was a percentage of the total contribution. So certainly Mont Vernon got a lot less than Nashua, but as a percentage of what you put in, it's the same amount. But we can get that. We um, b because of the way uh, c wages and contributions are reported to us and and some. Um, you know, when, when we begin to close the books after the fiscal year, um, you know, there's some reconciliation issues with numbers. So we, I think we have in town by town information on all but four employers that we're still working with them to, to true up exactly what they gave us and to, for them to get their reimbursement from the state. We, the money and that House Bill 1221 last year wasn't from NHRS. That was a general fund appropriation and that went through the Treasury, uh, you know, with the assistance of DRA. But I, I can I can get you that list of what people got. I'll send it to the full committee, or if there's a, there's an email for for such a group. Thank you. I would appreciate that. For other questions, Representative Evil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am new to the committee, and so this is rather a basic question. So um, I'm sorry for this <laughs> for other people, but. I, I really would like to just go back to the um, the origination story of the relationship between the towns and the state and and how this came to pass and part of my interest is whether the towns would have entered into this agreement if the if they'd known that the state might later renege on it so any you anything you can um, help me with I, I, I do have a a um document that talks about employer contributions that I can send over to the committee. I'll summarize now, but just 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 to have because because there are, um, you know, there, there's some I, I've seen that commentary for many years in many places, and I, I've never been able to, in, uh, in my research to to completely prove or disprove that contention. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that when NHRS was consolidated from four separate plans back in the 60s, uh, originally there was a 40% reimbursement uh, for teacher contributions by local school districts. And that was a carryover from the, the teacher's retirement system, which was the predecessor plan. And that the state had been doing that 40%, as far as I can see, back at least until the early 1950s, possibly all along. Um, we um, The discussion and deliberation of the college consolidation back in 67 aren't available online. They may be in the state archives, and I've never had the 48 hours or so free to go over there and bury myself in it because I, I'm quite interested in seeing what that what that was but I've never found a letter from the retirement system or the municipal association or the state or a news clipping or anything that specifically said this was a promise or this wasn't so I, I can't give you a definitive answer on that I, I do know that in 1977 that 40 percent change uh, the 40 percent state contribution was extended was reduced to 35 percent for schools but extended to group two police and fire and that those amounts were paid through um 2009 so 32 years and the legislature at that time reduced it on a provisional basis for two years to go to 30 percent and 10 25 percent and 11 and Back with when it was changed in 09, it was going to snap back to 35. Obviously, the state's financial picture changed considerably. It was already under uh, the, the Great Recession in 09, um, but it continued. So, uh, the, in, in 11, the legislature repealed that as a combination of the changes to the pension benefits that reduced costs for employers plus a, a three and a half uh, percent, three and a half million appropriation from the state. 
in the um, fiscal 12, 13 employer rates, it, they were paying what they would have been paying, you know, had the 35% gone in and the plan not changed for those two years. But then sort of the sticker shock hit the towns uh, in the 14, 15 rates. So they, then they, their out-of-pocket dollars went a lot uh, higher at that point. So, you know, there's a lot of pieces, but that sort of origin story I've never been able to get to the bottom of. Further question, Representative Evil? Representative Cambrels, did I say, say that correctly? Cambrels. Yeah. Uh, Representative McGuire then. Yeah, I wanted to follow up or ask Representative Evil's question in a slightly different way. Aren't um, municipalities and school districts political subdivisions of the state, and therefore, to what extent do they have choice in in being part of the retirement system? Um, for for and this this again dates back to the predecessor plans as well. But uh, if you if you employ full time teachers, police, or fire fighters, those positions are mandatory enrollment in the retirement system. So a town has no say. You know, if, they, if you're gonna you know you're a small town, you want to hire a couple of full timers on the fire department, whatever. Those people are active contributing members. You know, in group two, um, you know, the, you know they're some statutory um, exceptions to mandatory membership for things like, you know, fixed term appointments. But generally speaking, uh, you know, those positions are all in. Um, and for um, the state uh, participation in the retirement system is mandatory for state and New Hampshire employees, communities may opt to enter the retirement system for their full-time employees, capital E, you know, your town hall folks, your DPW folks, things like that. Um, that was also a component of what was then called the state employees retirement system back, you know, towns could do that back in the forties and fifties as well. So, um, you know, over the course of time, um, you know, we still see employers joining even, you know, now, you know, our, our, we always say we have about 460 employers because that number could change. Sometimes school districts bifurcate into two districts or we pick up a small town up north that never had anybody before, um, things like that. So so they have to have an affirmative vote of their governing body to enter into the retirement system going forward. So that that's how they, how they do it for their ease. Um, Manchester never did for its employees. They had their own plan. Um, I don't know when that started. Um, Nashua DPW is another separate retirement system, you know, completely outside of us for those employees in Nashua. And, and some towns may do um, defined contributions or you know IRA type setups, you know, for their plans. You know, we don't we don't know who's what people who aren't in the system do, if anything. But uh, that that's how it works. Thank you, Representative Hewitt. Any questions? So just following along, so if I understand what you are saying, there are certain employees of the political subdivisions that have to be part of the retirement system. And then you folks set the amount that has to be paid into the retirement system for those employees, regardless of who's making the payment. Correct. Okay, thank you. It's clear that you can't retire. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I can't get sick either. But um, we, we, we are coming back in tomorrow, unfortunately, because I was ill last week. We couldn't do it to do a sort of an orientation, bigger picture on the retirement system, how it works for this committee tomorrow afternoon at 3. So um, it would have been better to have that before you guys got your hands in the Hamburg. Representative Weiler, who's sitting in to keep an eye on uh, Representative McGuire. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, Mr. Carlin, looking at history of the system, when, we f when it first went everybody together, bringing in the towns as well as the state employees, my impression is those outside the state employees were a much smaller group than they are now, and now I believe they're like 70%. Can, can you remember any of those figures? Uh, I, I, I would have to look and see. I, I, you know, in general terms, I believe you're correct. I don't have any specific numbers to 
to look back and, and confirm that on. I could I could try to research it. I know the, the plan was much smaller, you know, obviously when we started and the state was a larger employer of full time employees. I think right. a lot of towns have added well both, you know, thinking about you know the 70s i mean even you know the 70s to the 90s the state's population grew so much certainly the teacher population grew considerably and probably public safety followed suit so you know i, I think there's you know i, I see your point my, my point is that you know that we never imagined there would be this much growth which we've witnessed and i've seen a lot of our small towns they start out with no one no employees except teachers they don't have they have on-call fire and on-call police, and then all of a sudden, why don't we have full-time? And so in my town, I, in 50-some years there in the town, I've seen them go from zero to now probably 40 or 50. And I think it's a pattern that's that's repeated all across the state, which, I mean, we have to be aware of that when we bring these things in, that now this is the major part of the uh, retirement system where it at the inception, it was just a small piece. So I think that's that's significant. We, we, we do have a slide that we're bringing along tomorrow, but our headcount of active members has been relatively flat over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, the, the distribution is a little different. We did lose a number of state employees back in the 2009-11 um, layoffs that 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 hit that head counts a little bit lower, and we've also seen a decrease in the number of active teachers over time, and that that seems to have rebounded a little in the past couple of years, but net over net, um, and that that's a sort of an aging of New Hampshire school aid population issue more than anything else. But we've seen growth in the numbers on the police and fire, and to some extent, local employees. All right. Um, well, you have one more question. Yeah. I'll well, related to what you just said, so I'm 65, and I, I'm uh, at the peak of the baby boom. So I'm guessing that a lot of people are retiring right now or have in recent years. Um, is the overall number of current employees, so, so what I'm saying is, is hiring in general for all employees in the system bigger than retirements, or at the moment, are retirements bigger than hiring? Uh, you know, the, the way, and if there's somebody behind me by now from NHMA, maybe they could speak to that with more authority than I can. I, we, when we are doing our head counts and things like that, they're always point in time as of June 30th. So that's active members as of and retired members, you know, as of things like that. And, and as I said, the active head count has been staying relatively flat. I think it went up a couple hundred, but you know, that, that with, when you're talking about close to 49,000 members, that's a small uh, variation year over year. In the past two years, we have seen a higher number of retirements than we've had in the prior, you know, two to four years behind that. I, I think, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, with COVID, you know, there was a lot of speculation over teachers going to bail on this and that. And actually what we've seen is more a uh, higher percentage on the public safety side, particularly police moving out. There may be a, a host of factors involved in that you know, beyond demographics. Um, but we, we wouldn't speculate because because we don't know that, you know, exactly what's driving an individual's choice. Representative Weiler. Well, we, are, we have to put together a balanced budget. We rely on the ways and means to give us a projection for roughly 27 months from the time we finish this. And they've been pretty accurate, sometimes 2% or less. And all the other things that are, we do in the budget, we say this is all you can spend. This is an uncontrollable figure. As we pointed out, the small towns keep adding people. There's a lot of pressure to give huge uh, increases in pay because of all the inflation. Those are things we have totally no control over. So for 27 months, we have no idea what's 27% of what. We have no clue. It could double. And that all of a sudden would unbalance this budget and we'd have no control. They'd, they'd come back to us and say, you screwed up. I don't want to hear that. I want to be able to say, we presented a budget. It came out within a couple of percent of what we thought it would be. We couldn't do that if we, had, if we passed this bill. Thank you. 
So, Marty, we'll be seeing you tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Maybe you can answer some of the questions that Representative Ebel had put forward as far as the history. Sounds like that would be a good time to get that in there. Um, Ms. Heck, uh, those questions that um, Representative Griffin had as far as if we gave the $26 million to the towns versus this annual contribution towards the retirement system, maybe you could put those numbers together for us. And, oh, you already have those. <laughs> Step forward then. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Catherine Heck. I am with the New Hampshire Municipal Association. We represent the 234 cities and towns or political subdivisions in New Hampshire. So I'm happy to answer some of your questions. I do have a document um, to your question, Representative Griffin, that contains the, the amounts at certified as of September 30th. I know there's an updated record, but this is what I was able to bring. So you can have a look and see how this was distributed town by town, school district by school district. Anecdotally, for example, the city of Rochester received $163,000 and the Rochester School District received $395,000. That's for example. The town of Allenstown received $19,000 for an example, and the town of Epsom, $15,000. So you're correct that there's, it, it really is um, dependent on the number of full-time employees and to Representative Weiler's point, um, and it will vary significantly town by town, school by school, but then you can get a sense of what the impact was. Um, this bill in particular, um, when we're comparing House Bill 1221, last year's bill, which was a one-time payment, that was structured a little bit differently. It was $26.7 million was the estimate. And that was a reimbursement. So towns paid 100% and received a reimbursement based on this formula. They reported it on the MS 434, the majority, there were a few towns that it wasn't quite reconciled. So therefore, reporting it as revenue reduced the tax rate because they didn't get their check till December. So it's not as if they spent the money. The bill that we're looking at today, House Bill 50, would reinstate 7.5%. So it would reduce the cost. So towns would only have to budget 92.5 therefore reducing their budget line when they're asking for the appropriation on the front side. So they are a little bit different and the one-time payment, but I do think last year's one-time payment was very well received. It made a tremendous difference. And I think you can kind of get a sense of the impact that it had on cities and towns. So I also appreciate um, some of the comments about being a little bit of a moving target right, as we can't predict salaries or raises that might need to be put in place to retain employees. We, towns are, like the state, unable to employ. Um, they are still looking and having the same retention issues and the same replacement issues that we're seeing in all industries all over the state, the country. So while we do try one for one, it's not necessarily the case if we can't find a qualified candidate or, or no one's applying for the jobs. And of course, in theory, some senior people might leave and a newer person might, a junior person may take over at what we might assume to be a lower rate, but we can't guarantee that in today's market. So all, all things to certainly consider. And I can also appreciate as a finance person, you know, again, that moving target that you talk about. So of course, if the state capped the reimbursement of seven and a half percent or up to a certain dollar amount that could certainly assist in the budgeting process because I can appreciate that you have to bring forward a balanced budget as a resident myself of the state of New Hampshire. That's important work as well. So I'm happy to answer other questions that you might have if I didn't cover things. So to Representative Griffin's question earlier, he was, I think, looking, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, but if we were to distribute, say, that nearly $27 million to the towns, not through the retirement system, but based on, say, their population, how would that compare to what they would get under the 7.5 versus a contribution? Is like revenue sharing, that type right. of thing. So, so if we look at meals and rooms that was distributed at 121 million, that would be maybe really roughly a fifth of that, and that's just strictly population based. So we can certainly, I can certainly get a spreadsheet and do that math for you to see what that would look like. Um, 
in a different way solely based on population using meals and rooms formula if that's acceptable to you. Okay, I'm happy to do that for you. Further questions, Representative Weiler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Heck. We, in this current budget, and for the year 2023, are giving back $100 million from SWEPT directly to the property tax payers. Have you done an analysis of how much that's going to each town? So SWEPT is, um, so the 100000 on SWEPT is very interesting, and there has 100 been- $100 million. $100 million. I'm sorry. That's a very different number. Yes. But who's counting? There's just a few zeros there. I apologize, I made the sir. same mistake myself. I'm sorry. Um, that's very interesting in that analysis as SWEPT is collected and retained locally. It does not go back up to the state and then be redistributed back to the cities and towns. So what some other policy analysts have noticed, so I don't do education funding particularly, although it all interplays and all interacts, so I do follow the conversation. Um, the reduction of SWEPT has led property poor towns to having to raise funds locally because the reduction isn't covering their portion of the school bill. Property wealthy towns, I believe you've seen, um, there was an injunction because they were retaining more than what they needed. So while um, it's certainly on paper a reduction to the taxpayer, and I'm sure all the taxpayers appreciate it, if it has to be flip-flopped and raised on the local school tax, there really was no net reduction. So I don't have the data on that. I do know that there have been some analysis on how that swept work now that we've done it for two years to further understand the property valuation and how it impacts the swept tax. Thank you. Thank you. So what we'll do now, since I try to keep right on schedule, um, we'll reschedule this work session for a later date when um, the questions that Representative Ebel had, McGuire and Griffin, are addressed. We're hearing from the retirement system tomorrow again at 3. You're welcome to join us, Ms. Heck. Thank you. And uh, we'll schedule another work session after we get those answers. Thanks. Thank you very much. Just get one more for the file. Thanks. So next we have House Bill 555, appropriating state general fund surplus towards the retirement system unfunded liability. Anyone like to come forward? Ah, yes, the representative from Hudson. Yes, I'm uh, Representative Tony Luckus, representing Hillsborough 38, the towns of Hudson and Litchfield. Thanks for it. And, and, yep, thank you uh, to the uh, subcommittee. Um, so the, uh, the pension fund has uh, something on the order of five billion in unfunded liability. Uh, there's someone here from the retirement system that can probably provide uh, more detailed uh, data on that. And um, there was a, uh, uh, you know, there's a history of it being unfunded. There was a um, some. Uh, legislative action that took place around 2010 to put it on the path to be fully funded and under statute it's supposed to be by about 2039. So the way that's uh, the unfunded liability is currently being paid is um, all the employers and in that context it's all the government uh, entities that have employees in the pension fund so that's uh, uh, the state, the counties, uh, cities, towns, school districts, etc. Uh, they're paying a percentage of their total payroll, the payroll of their employees that are in the pension system, 
towards the unfunded liability. So they're paying two parts, the cost to actuarially soundly pay for the pensions for their current employees, and then a portion for uh, paying off the unfunded liability and to get it done by 2039. Um, again, person for retirement system can provide uh, more details, but I believe it's something on average, um, more than 80% of what all those government employers are paying is to pay the unfunded liability, not the current pension. It may be less than that, but um, we can get that number. Uh, and that comes in most cases directly out of uh, everybody's property tax. So the idea is that um, if we have a surplus and if the, uh, what's colloquially known as the rainy day fund is, is maxed out, that um, a portion of any remaining money go towards the unfunded liability, 75% is, is what I picked, but if the committee wants a different percentage, I'd be fine with 100% or whatever. Um, and you know, putting money into that early is like paying your mortgage off early because that invested money gets a return and it will more quickly um, pay that off. And every two years, the pension system calculates the percentage of the total payroll that goes towards paying off the unfunded liability. And if the amount owed, you know, that is not funded uh, goes down, then that is going to go down. And as there's return gained on that money that's invested, it'll go down further as you go. And um, eventually at the end, not only are the uh, employers going to be paying less because they won't be paying off the unfunded liability, but the way the system is set up, uh, the employee contribution will uh, actually go down as well as that's paid off. Because uh, right now, the employees are paying over half of the cost of their pension. Their employer is paying a smaller amount. And I believe in statute, um, the employees can't be higher than the employer. So as the employee part goes down, um, the employers would have to, I mean, the employee, as the employer's part goes down, the employees would have to as well. So, I mean, it's one way to get a, uh, at least the opportunity for a property tax reduction for everybody, assuming the money isn't just spent by the uh, employer. So that's, that's all I have. Questions for Representative Likas. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Representative Parsons, right? Pearson. Pearson. Thank you. For the record, Representative Steve Pearson, him, Rockingham District 13 now, which is the town of Derry. I'm a co-sponsor of this legislation. Um, just, to, just to add a little bit to what re the representative from Hudson said, when, the, when all 50 states took a deep dive, when, when the alarm was sounded back in around 07, there were 50 different concepts, 50 different ideas, right? Every state looked at their situation and said okay we all got to do something so and they all came up with different ideas and you know as we look forward 15 years later we see that there were states that were serious and then there were states that were maybe serious for a year new hampshire um, after the decennial commission and and the real hard look at what was going on there put into pl place a plan that was serious but in the grand scheme of things, looking at some other states, not necessarily as quick. We decided to do over a 30-year run. Some states were much more aggressive. And I think that, you know, when you have an opportunity to pay your bills, you, you should do so. That, that's, a, that's something that people in their personal finances do. It's something certainly that the state should be doing as well. So I think this, this kind of shifts the gear a little bit. It moves us up into a little bit more of an aggressive stance to, to do this. And especially now in a down market, infusing that system with any sort of money certainly has a multiplier effect as the market rises. So, you know, I fully support this concept. I think that it's something maybe we should have been, you know, really brought into play years ago. Uh, but here we are. And you know, I think that if we're going to be serious about getting this taken care of, uh, then now's the time. 
The, the only thing with the bill that I would ask is that the bill does not differentiate as to where that goes. And I, and I think that, cause you can't just blanketly say, well, we're just going to put it into pension debt because the pension system's broken down into categories. So I would like to see the bill amended to just have an earmark of 50, 50% to group one, 50% to group two. I, I just think that that would just direct funding, um, a little bit rather than just be a blanket because you have to, you have to categorize it somewhere. It, we, we think of things as a giant pot of money, but, and I'm sure Mr. Carlin from retirement can explain that it's not just exactly a giant pot. So, um, so that's the only ask I would have with that, but, but I do support the concept. Any, anything to any venture to pay debt that the state has in any, in any idea I think is good. So thank you for your time with this. And, uh, and I, I'll certainly entertain any questions you may or may not have. Questions? Uh, seeing none, thank, thank you very you, much. Sir. And we'll get together with Marty and see if we can't figure out a distribution as you suggested. Marty? Thank you, Mr. Chair, again, for the record, Marty Carlin from the New Hampshire Retirement System. Um, just wanted to, to build on uh, what the sponsors just said. And <clears throat> also, it was a question that came up last week that I have a, a partial answer on that I can share with this group. Um, you know, last week, um, when when uh, representative uh, of the retirement system was test testifying, he, you know, correctly said that, you know, there's no you know, if, if people want to give us money, you know, we don't have any philosophical objections or statutory uh, problems accepting payments over and above. But I do want to clarify that our, our board hasn't taken a position on this bill. We do see it as policy, which is completely on, on uh, this side of the river, and we wouldn't necessarily opine on it one way or the other. Just, But in general terms, again, you know, we're not going to say no. Uh, to additional funding towards the unfunded liability. Um, question that came up is, well, you know, how, how might that work? You know, if, if we gave you X, what's, how's that going to help? And, and, and um, you know, essentially any, any appropriation under this bill would be, you know, would just be X'd off an amount of the unfunded liability, which was currently at the end of last fiscal year, 5.69 billion. Uh, it's a large number. Most of that five billion, five plus billion, is scheduled to be paid off by 2039, um, as part of the initial legislative changes to amortize it over 30 years. Um, I, I did reach out to the actuary because, you know, appropriations are so time dependent. We couldn't say, oh, if we had a hundred million, hundred and twenty million dollar surplus in 2028, what is it going to do? It, it, you know, we couldn't tell you with any degree of certainty, but as a hypothetical, I asked um, if, if NHRS last, if this was in effect, you know, with the current state surplus and we got a, an appropriate uh, 50 million towards the unfunded liability, that would increase um, employer contribution rates uh, by between uh, 0.1 and 0.2% of payroll, depending on the member group, if it was distributed sort of evenly, if, if we have a different distribution method, that may change it a little, but essentially that would be uh, 4.1 4 million less in contributions we'd be asking employers for in 24. So, you know, okay, you're putting 50 million up front, but, but that, that's, you know, that the rates would be, that would be a permanent increase um, because we have that money, you know, in the bank and being invested. So it's not a one year savings. You're, you're, you're accruing that over time. Um, you know, you're, you'll, you'll get more than you put in, uh, you know, um, based on the investment income. I think you got Representative McGuire's attention. Representative McGuire. Not specifically, but was Representative Pearson correct that you think of the unfunded liability as there's so much group one unfunded liability, or there's so much group two unfunded liability, or maybe there's other categories? Yeah. The, you know, for fi financial accounting and actuarial purposes, all four plans, employee, teacher, and poli teachers, police, and fired liabilities are calculated uh, separately, there are different assumptions for the you know group one and group two and things like that. So that's 
one of the reasons, you know, when because the employer rates are developed separately for those four groups as well. So, you know, there are in our annual reports, um, you know, a funded ratio for the fire plan and for the teacher's plan. So, you know, and then the numbers that we tend to, to speak to with the committee is the aggregate number for the whole plan, which is 65.6% funded. I actually brought uh, copies of all of our annual reports and our current statute book. I was going to drop a copy off with uh, Ms. Clayman for reference for the finance office and a copy for LBA as well um, to, to go in. I, uh, and I think those numbers that I'm speaking to are actually in our valuation, which is posted on our website. But so there are different liabilities, um, you know, for diff different funding ratios for the respective groups. I think most recently the group two plans are have a better funded ratio even though the, the rates are, are that much you know higher and in, in, in percent of pay uh and part of that was some legislation back in the, the 2000s and early 2010s moving money from the special account and from medical subsidy accounts and things like that and that money was credited to the group two plans uh, because it was taken out um for the insurance uh, piece for the special account for them so you know and, and you know there, there's some you know, in the teacher plan is, is I definitely the, the lowest funded of the four, and that's sort of a function of that lowering headcount that we, we've seen. So, so there are variations, you know, on the plan level. Um, I think, you know, without specific guidance, we would probably look at if, you know, I, I don't want to speak for the actuary, but I would think they'd look as, you know, the employee population is about 50% of the total membership. Teachers are about 35, you know, that we'd, any of these funding infusions could theoretically be, you know, would probably most logically without other direction, just apply them as a percentage of the size of the total group. If, if the bill was amended uh, with representative Senator Pearson, you know, it would, you know, more money going towards group two is than their proportion of the membership would lower those rates more. Those are the highest rates. Those are the ones we hear most about from employers. So, you know, there's some policy considerations, are for you all and how you would want to distribute any of these appropriations um that would be up to you guys we, we wouldn't have have a position on what you how you would do that follow up so do you think that the bill as written is unimplementable because of this question or would you have to adopt rules or something that decide that make that decision i mean when we looked at it we we, we haven't done a you know a 360 on that specific question i i think you know the, the working assumption was you know that you know administratively what what's the what's the most reasonable perspective and and you know again if we you know applying it to the to each group as a percentage of their size of the total seems logical, but you know there are other reasonable arguments that can be made for another one. Um, you know, if if the legislature or an employer group wanted to challenge that, then we'd have to kind of figure out where to go from there. But um, you know that um, you know we we didn't, haven't drilled down that far. It, it was a question that we didn't contemplate. Representative Watt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question on the five-year smoothing that was used to uh, adopt an, a rate of return that was that was used to assess the rates that people paid for the thing. I remember that the 90s, we were running at better than 9% returns on this. And then we got to 2000, we had a <clears throat> big drop in 2001, and for the whole 10 years of, of the 2000s, first 10 years, um, it barely made 5%. And yet the retirement system kept assuming eight and a half most of the time through there. And the Delta kept growing. And I kept criticizing the system over why are you doing this? Because you're making the Delta grow bigger. And they said, oh, we have five year smoothing. Is that a law or a rule? Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's an actuarial practice it's it's within you know the actuarial standards to do that i mean you know you know the board could adopt a policy to smooth over four years or six years but there's there's a range and and most plans do the five-year smoothing i you know I, I can't speak for why the board kept the assumed rate of return at eight and a half percent until uh, i think it was um 2011 uh, after that 
2005 to 10 experience that they lowered it to seven and three quarters. Now it's, it's currently six and uh, three quarters. Um, you know, partially though, on, in a, the night of the no folks, the new folks aren't going to get the, uh, the reference, but the special account was something that had been in statute for a number of years and it took any percentage over the assumed rate of return and segregated it for COLAs and medical benefits. And, and there was almost a perverse incentive to have a higher assumed rate of return. So you're catching some of the stuff that would have flowed into the special account and that was repealed in 11. Yeah. And, and so that, that may be some of the history there for the board's thinking, but again, I, I, I wasn't here to watch. And we discovered another significant difference in in the 90s when we were assessing uh, cost of living increases from the excess that went into the special fund. And that was that, and, and one of my friends who was a fireman said, oh, they're prejudiced against the firemen. But this was the truth. Um, a lot of people get into teaching. They pay so much into the system, and so does the employer. If you leave before you're vested, you take all the money that you contributed, but the money that the employer contributed stays in the fund. So there was much more surplus in the teacher fund than there was in either police or fire. Fire had the least surplus because most firemen stayed for a whole career, police a little less so, but teachers did not stay as long, especially since they'd have to do like a 30 year career and go to age 65. So it was interesting how those things varied as well. And that's another thing that has to be taken into account. Thank you. That's very interesting. And, and it, teachers, I mean, teachers, uh, firefighters are still uh, the group that retires with the, the most years of service on average when they go out, um, you know, and, and, you know, a little bit higher age than police. And that, so that, that's held. And even when I talk about the retirement rates in recent years, it's been more on the police than the fire side. Um, So Marty, maybe uh, tomorrow or the next day, you could give us some more hypotheticals. You gave a really good one with the 50 million in the savings, but giving us some more hypotheticals might be worthwhile to look at. We like looking at numbers and- yeah. I, I can see what they can turn around for us, you know, but again, if, we're, if it's a, uh, an infusion that's coming, you know, years down the road, it's like, I don't think they're even gonna be comfortable calculating it just because, I mean, I asked them for 50 and 100 and, you know, 50 was 4.1 million less, 100 million was 8.1 million less. So, you know, they, 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 it's fairly linear. You know, you can just pick the number and, and apply that percentage to it. But um, I, I can see what, um, what if anything, they, they'd be comfortable doing with this. But again, in so much it's timing, you know, and it even, even market timing, you know, oh, we got 50 million and the markets took off. I'm gonna have much better off than if it went the other way in that year. But um you know so so we'll see what i can do but I, I don't think i can promise much more than sort of the real broad brush here oh even a broad brush is good uh so you were you said that the retirement system is not supportive i, I had notes now i know you weren't here at the uh, last week when they some an attorney i believe came in represent yeah. and he stated that the uh, retirement system supported that so you Taking that back, I guess. Yes, yeah, spiritually supported it, but not officially, and we haven't brought it to the board. Um, okay. Just yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we try to try to stay out of policy issues, and, and other than giving numbers and things like that, um, sometimes we veer over that you know line occasionally by accident, and we want to try to walk it back if we do. No, I thought it was great as I'm one of the sponsors of the bill that I thought was a great <laughs> statement to thank Tony. A it was a great, bill, I which... think it's a very good bill personally and maybe no. needs a, a couple little tweaks. But any other further questions? Uh, Representative Weiler. I, I see these two bills as, as being comparable. They both have an attempt to reduce property taxes. I think this bill does more to reduce property taxes long term than 50. 50 is likely to be a one-time thing, and it's it's such a small piece of the 1.3 billion that we do for property tax relief that I don't think it, I think it would get swallowed up and rounding virtually. But this this uh, hopefully will have a big amount. Plus, I like the fact that we can control it. It's not a loose end. If we see this surplus, then we have a good place to put it, 
rather than saying, okay, we're going to put more money there, but we don't know how much it will be. I like from the standpoint of doing budgets, I like this bill much better than 50. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any further questions? Uh, seeing none, we'll close the work session. Up, oh, Tony. Sure. Just briefly, unless I misheard, I believe a previous speaker said that putting this extra money in would increase the employee payment. I assume he misspoke, but... That's how I took it. I think it was a mistake. Right. right. And, and the other thing, as far as the idea of deciding which uh, pot it goes into, I have no objection to that. I would just suggest that it be worded such that if one of them is paid off, that the money would go to the others. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, oh, Ms. Heck. Thank you, Representative. Before you close the hearing, I did want to take the opportunity to say that we strongly support this legislation on behalf of the cities and towns that we represent. This is a long-term strategy. It will have long-term positive implications. It will reduce property taxes. And while we won't see immediate benefits, maybe in 24 or 25, till the actuaries start to redo the calculations, we will see long-term benefits over time with 75 to 80% of our costs being on the unfunded liability. So I just wanted to say we very much support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And somebody just whispered in my ear they might like to make a motion. So I'd recognize uh, Representative McGuire. So I'd move off to pass. The motion's been made and seconded. Seconded by Representative Weiler. We'll give the clerk just a minute to get his paperwork together. Sure, go ahead. Yes, uh, the motion is out to pass. Was there a consideration to amend it, uh, or is it going to be just like this? Just like this. Okay. Representative McGuire uh, likes to take a jump every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly while the clerk is getting ready, uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll explain why. So I think I, this to me seems like good policy, but it's somewhat aspirational in the sense that I don't think the rainy day fund has ever been big enough to cause this to trigger, right? And so this is something that's maybe, if we're lucky, is going to happen way down the road. Um, but it's good policy, and we ought to imply it. Um, also, what often happens in the budget is things like this get overridden, right? And so, so it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> so it's good policy, but, but it may or may not actually happen, I guess is my point. Other question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think I, I like it. Uh, my question was more of what we discussed earlier in that we needed to define what portions would go to the different groups. So would an amendment be required or would that be something we would do later? Uh, as it's been presented, would pass as is. Now anyone's free to offer an amendment, say, before the full committee, if they thought it was necessary. Mr. Clark? I'll still fight. Aye. Aye. Yes. 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 Okay, Mr. Chair, 
Yes. So sorry. Vote being unanimous. Um, all to pass uh, goes forward at a vote of nine to zero. Eight, I believe. Eight, eight to zero. Oh, excuse me, eight to zero. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for your testimony. Everybody out there. Representative Buco. Uh, now we're going to hear House Bill 311 FNA making an appropriation to the Department of Environmental Services for eligible wastewater projects known affectionately to a lot of us as Buco Box. Representative Buco. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, so, my, for the record, my name is Tom Buco. I'm uh, a representative of Carroll County District 2. Uh, District 1 changed. Um, and I'm here, I'm here today to introduce House Bill 311 and to ask that uh, the committee uh, find this bill ought to pass or retain. Um, as you mentioned in, in the past, um, We've been we've been submitting so th this let me just go over this quickly this is there's a state aid grant program that um su su supplements or uh, <laughs> wastewater projects and uh, and many of you recognize that i've been in this i've been submitting these bills for about 13 years now there used to be level funded program, however, it, it, and um, when the governor, ex by executive order, swept out the account, it's taken us 13 years to catch up. To catch up, so the, the intent of this bill is to is not to fund a particular list of projects as the others were, but to level fund this program, so that it so that the funding is there and and we don't have to submit these lists every every two, every two years um, the uh, the fiscal note e explains the amounts and shows uh, and shows you the where the where the funding where the funding requests are this year. I think um, also, um, Mr. Chairman, I would like to introduce an amendment, and I don't know what your process is in this committee for doing that. Have you given a copy to uh, the LBA or? Uh, no, I just had it drafted. I just had an unapproved copy, uh, un unapproved amendment drafted at OLS. Now oh, you can certainly speak to your amendment. It's a simple, it, it's simple. It's just what I just said about submitting particular list of projects every two years. Instead of doing that, this funding was, will go into maintenance or efficiency, what's called efficiency, the efficiency account now. And, and instead of, instead of having to, to, um, Instead of having to f submit the list every every two years, this will be a level funded program, and the, so the the, uh, the the amendment all the amendment says is that it shall be non lapsing, and that'll that'll keep the program going. So they so so what happens with these projects is that you know you first have to get local uh, uh, um, approval to issue the bonds. Then you have to have all the engineering, then you have the construction, and then it's about 10 years by the time it it's, gets to the point where it's got one year of um, substantial completion. And that's the only time that, that's when the funding comes in, after, the, after all of that is done, after the project is complete. So it, it's, it's kind of hard to, to 
the, 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 these lists are just estimates, and the costs are estimates. So by level funding the program and by keeping it non-lapsing, there'll be, there'll be, the funds will be in the program every year, and uh, municipalities will be, have confidence in, in applying for the, pro for, the, for the program, and the department will have funding to be able to put towards these projects. And I, I think I'll just stop there and take questions if, if I can. <laughs> questions for Representative Bucco. Yeah, just, just for clarity, um, what you're saying is before doing what you're proposing here, towns are, uh, would be in the position to have to commit to a project without knowing full well that those funds are going to be available for them. And this, this would alleviate that question mark. Is that another yes. way of putting it? Yes, yes, that, that's correct, Mr. Uh, Representative. In, in fact, what used to be called the delayed and deferred list were projects that went ahead, got completed, and then the, then the state reneged on the funding. And that's, that's what started the, the, uh, the, uh, the defer, delayed and deferred list. And, and, and as I said, it's taken us 14, 15 years to catch up. And that last year, we finally caught up, actually. Um, and so, it, so, so that municipalities don't have to go ahead and issue bonds and go through all the construction and then find out that they're not going to get the money that the state. It's in law. It's RSA 486. It's in law, and they should they should they should be able to have confidence that they're going to be that they're going to get the funding when the project is done. Further questions, Representative McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. So I represent the town of Epsom. I don't believe that anyone ever I, I believe that everyone in our town has their own septic system so why should my constituents be paying for these kind of systems for others so the purpose of these the purpose of these um, grants was to incentivize municipalities to 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 um, come up to standards with with um, on, with with their with their wastewater treatment and collection, um, in order to keep the groundwater clean, the purpose was the groundwater. Um, it's, it's if there's if there's no there's no there's no uh, community um, wastewater collection in in Epsom at all in Epping. I don't believe so. We do have a small water district with a with a community well for part of our town. There's a there's kind of like an older part of town that had smaller lots. They have a community well, but but I don't. There's no wastewater treatment plant or anything like that. So th this this program started many years ago, and, and as I said, the incentive was to, to keep the groundwater clean, and so it. it um, it was based on municipalities. If I could, for Representative Bucco, one of the things that you need in a state are wastewater treatment plants to treat septage from septic tanks. So that's one of the other features of this legislation that you have a place to take your septage. So in his town, for instance, those folks have a place to take their yes, septage. That, thank you. That's that's correct. Thank you. Representative Hewitt, followed by Representative Weiler. No, I, I, I think we've all received this, this piece. That you mailed it to all the members, right? Municipal state aid and revenue sharing. It has a piece on page 14 pointing out $276 million came to the state from the ExxonMobil MTBE lawsuit which went to a trust fund, an 18-member commission uh, comprised of state and local officials is giving out loans, and they've given out so far $125 million. That may have affected why 
other parts of the state budget didn't put as much money into this as they had previously because there was another source of revenue. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Representative Weiler. Anything else, Representative Bucco? Uh, no. One of the things in the past, for those of you that haven't been on this division, we often retain this and have put it in the budget. And that's not to say we wouldn't do that again. We could act on it one way or the other today or hold on to it and uh, see what the governor's budget has included. Because I noted uh, on the uh, fiscal note, it says the these amounts have been included in the department's operating budget requests for 2024 and 2025 as additional prioritized need requests. So it would appear maybe DES has got them in their budget, but we'll find out shortly. What, what I can show you here is This is the this is the department's request, and uh, for, for this particular uh, account, and they, under efficiency there's there's zero, so they're not they're not carrying forward um, the, the the projects that are already have already been started getting payments. That's what that would be in the efficiency budget. What they have here is is um, additional prioritized needs. And those are generally considered the, the new the, the new projects that they expect to come online during the during um, this biennium. We have the Department of Environmental Services coming in tomorrow at one p.m. So we'll try to get that cleared up. Um, Thank, yes. yes. Thank you, ma'am. Oh. Yeah, if once Representative Bucco is finished, if you'd like to come forward and state your name for the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, Tracy Wood. I'm the administrator of the Wastewater Engineering Bureau at New Hampshire DES, which resides in the Water Division under Rainey Pelletier. So maybe you can clear up any confusion as far as the department's support or not support or including these figures in the budget coming forward. Yes, happy to do so. So when we prepared our budget for the 24-25 biennium, we were held at a 3% increase from our 23 budgets. For this particular line item, state aid grant, for the 20 fiscal year 23 budget, it was actually funded from a 21 surplus monies. And so when you look at our budget, the line item says zero for fiscal year 23, and 3% of $0 is $0. <laughs> so we could not carry it in our operating budget. So what we did is we, car we carried it as a prioritized need. And so that is in our request for SAG monies as in our request as a prioritized need. <laughs> it's budgeting, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so is everybody as confused as I am or <laughs> yeah, I know. I... yeah exactly but because of the, the, the surpluses they dealt with zero in previous budget they, it was somewhat limited right so it's an extra need it's an addition to their budget request exactly exactly in a normal year we would have an allotment like fiscal year 23, like we would have carried in our normal budget a line item amount, but we didn't because it came from surplus for 21, which got carried over. It's all semantics, but yes, we normally carry monies in our budget every fiscal year for maintenance payments for state aid grant. Any further questions? Representative Griffin? Ebel? I thought I saw a question on your face. Well, I, no, do you? 
Okay. Have you seen the um, amounts that are needed to upgrade these wastewater treatment plants greatly increasing because of increasing pollutants that are coming in, like PFAS, new standards, that sort of thing? What we're dealing with right now is last year was the celebration of 50 years of the Clean Water Act, and that's when the majority of our wastewater treatment facilities were built. And some communities over time put monies into their infrastructure. Others did not so much. So we're dealing with aging infrastructure is the biggest piece. And then, yes, e New Hampshire is not a delegated state. EPA Region 1 is our permitting authority. And yes, every permit that comes out is always more stringent than the previous permit. They never get less stringent. They, they, they get more stringent. So what we're dealing with, mainly right now is nutrient issues, metal issues. Yes, we are seeing uh, EPA has putting PFAS monitoring in NIPTES permits, um, but it's just monitoring and it actually hasn't even started yet because we're waiting for EPA to come out with a validated method before they give the go ahead for communities to start monitoring for PFAS in their systems. And I don't know in the long run with wastewater treatment, you know, PFAS is is a huge issue and it's just not going to be economical to, to treat at the wastewater treatment facilities on a large scale. And that's why you'll see in the permit that EPA is targeting industrial facilities and looking at those sources within the collection system to, to try to address it at the source instead of at the end pipe, right? Because wastewater treatment facilities, they're not generating PFAS, they're the receivers of PFAS, and so trying to stop it before it gets there. Follow up? I would just say I've introduced a bill to help with some of that already, and I think the focusing on the front end is, uh, is really important. Mr. Chair, can I just, I'm sorry to ask this, these historical things, but the state aid grant program, folks basically come up with their construction and maintenance ideas and they present it at a fairly basic level to DES and it's kind of guaranteed you get 20% or how much of a lift is it to get the 20% if that's what I read here about 486. So, I may be wrong. So what happens is uh, the state grant program is an after the fact grant program. So it's once a project is complete, then they come in with an application and we review that application and then they'll get between 20 and 30 percent. It depends on different criteria that we have and they'll get an award based on their principal and interest payments over the life of their loan. And I will say, um, you know, Representative Buko made a, an excellent comment. I'm having a lot of conversations with communities right now, and you know they want to know about state aid grant. They want to know is this active? Is it up? Because this may be the one piece that gets them to the finish line. So we're working with communities to leverage different funding sources, and then like say they came in for a clean water SRF loan, and it was a million dollar project, and then we'll offer them maybe a certain amount of subsidy say maybe we can give them 20 to 30 percent and so you'll take that off the top so say you had a million dollar loan we're giving you 30 percent subsidy you're down to 700,000 then they get to that point and they may look at other sources too like northern borders rural development there's lots of funding sources but then when they get that final amount then they'll say okay if state aid grant is active I'm going to get 20 to 30 percent on that remaining 700,000 that's going to help me with my payments over time and it'll, it'll attenuate the impacts to the users on the system and the rate increases over time is what it does. Representative Evil, there's never a bad question. <laughs> well, um, gonna I, go I was going to say <laughs> just getting to uh, Representative McGuire's point and then uh, about, you know, there are towns that don't have uh, 
right? Um, and then Representative or Chair Leishman pointed out we all need some place to put our own individual septage, but mm -hmm. that's true also for land li landfill leachate, right? Correct. There's the waste, the landfill leachate comes from the landfills where a lot of our stuff goes mm -hmm. to the wastewater treatment plants. So they really provide sort of a global service. They do. Um part of the bill monies that we're receiving. So Clean Water SRF is receiving emerging contaminants monies, not as much as they're receiving on the drinking water side. And we're utilizing those monies for projects to address landfill leachate. Again, stopping it at the source, breaking that cycle before it gets to the wastewater treatment plant. So any community that has a municipal landfill that discharges to their municipal wastewater treatment facility can come in for a project and get a grant. Um, North Conway's coming in, they're our first project, and they're gonna be looking at the treatment, different piloting, different technology to see how they can treat the landfill leachate so that it's cleaner before it gets sent to the wastewater treatment plant. Well, there's limited funds in that, but it's still some funds, and that's a 100% grant. So those projects won't be coming in for SAG. <laughs> Represent Weiler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, reading in the CAFR that uh, DES has chosen 12 parts per trillion for PFAS, which no one else has chosen, and I don't believe there's any scientific evidence for such choice. And now it's in court. Can you give us any update on where it stands? That I cannot. I, <laughs> I follow PFAS up here, but I look at it as, you know, what's in, how it's impacting my wastewater treatment facility. So on the setting of any levels and the science of that, I, I stay back. Perhaps you, you. when the uh, <laughs> folks come in tomorrow, you can let them know that question may be asked. Sure. Happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hoffman. I just wanted to add a couple of points that I think are important. Um, one is funding for these projects was included in House Bill 2, which you could argue is part of the budget and therefore should be part of the budget going forward because it's a 20-year commitment. These are for approved project projects that have already been awarded and gone to government council. Now, the department has specific instructions for preparing their budget, but I think you could argue very strongly that this should be should have been part of the base budget. Thanks, Michael. Any further, Ms. Wood? Or? Any other questions? All right, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bill. Can you state your name for the record, please? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bill Hounsel. Uh, I've uh, worked on this bill in 1989, so I've been involved in it for a bit of time. I was formerly in the House from 84 to 87. I was Vice Chairman of House Education Committee. Uh, but I've been following water since I was a precinct commissioner in 77 in Conway Village, and then a selectman in Conway, and then to the House of Representatives. I've been involved in water from most of my life. My father was a master plumber, so I grew up in a plumbing family. Excuse so me. So I, I know the value of water. Bill, I think our clerk has a question. Okay. Just, I just need to know who you're speaking on behalf. I'm of. speaking on behalf of Granite State Rural Water Association as a policy analyst for that uh, entity, and uh, I'm uh, representing North Conway Water Precinct and Lower Bartlett Water Precinct, uh, uh, two north and south areas of Mount Washington Valley. Um, North Conway actually filed the uh, the bill in 89 uh, and created a state aid grant. Back in the 70s, you realize the uh, feds had, uh, I think it was uh, 70, the state had 20, and the local was five. And that's how most of these wastewater plants were built back in those days. A lot of them are aging, of course, and there's a great need to upgrade them, but there's a greater need to expand them uh, to, to get to areas that uh, 
don't have the ability to have on-site sewer for how affordable housing so it blends in with the state need to uh, address that as well as protecting its rivers and its uh, and its water sources uh, the the state aid grant i think representative emmerich said it very well i thought representative buco in his long enduring relentless uh, efforts with his bills every year since 2008 in particular has been the suspenders to the line item bill. Uh, and I thought that was a good analogy that, that Representative Emmerich laid forward. The pants fell down in 2008. They almost were to the knees. And Tom, his bill every year has, uh, until last session, has been pulling them up. Last session, thanks to a bipartisan effort and all you folks, we got the belt at the waist level. The problem is it's, it's about to sink again at a time when there's an awful lot of federal money coming in that would help us. This, this is a three-legged stool of federal, state, and local funding. And I'm, I'm always representing the local effort, as is Representative Buco, because we came from that history and that knowledge. The bonds wouldn't pass at the local level to do the amazing amount of work that's being done without that state aid grant partnership. And the people pass those bonds with, an, with the understanding that the law says the state shall pay. So it's, uh, it's more a moral battle. The law is there. It's just, uh, it, it's, it's in the legislature, it's an educational battle. Uh, it's quite complex unless you've lived at the local level and followed it all the way through. But what happens, what this bill does in essence especially the non-lapsing, which we're trying to get in this session. If, if that's successful, we might be able to do away with the suspenders going forward. The non-lapsing would allow the, the, the money that you put in the House Bill 2, because all this bill is really doing is allowing us to get in at the ground level, at a presentation of the finance on the, on the bill, and have a dissertation all the way through to try to get the language in the House Bill 2, the trailer bill, it describes how those funds will go to the municipalities. A couple of sessions ago, it was clarified for the first time that this money in the state aid grant isn't the DES budget. It's money that passes from the general fund of the people back to the people in this partnership of a partnership of long-term debt uh, uh, payments and principal interest on their, on the local debt and the local debts could be, I think it's probably 250 million anyway of construction. It, yes, and we're only asking to support it at, at a flat line level of about 15 million a year and, and non-lapse it so that the agency, the engineering bureau can, t can have that money when those projects are done. And when we say done, they have to be certified as completed. And then there has to be a one year warranty and, those, and then usually the bonds for the federal government, whether it's rural development or state revolving loan fund, come due a year after. So to have the money non-lapsing means that money is there when that certification is ready to go to government and council. This also takes the, really clarifies that any direction from the governor to put a uh, percentage uh, reduction on all bureaucracies like they did in 2008, would not affect this money yet from the bureaucracy's point of view. And if it's non-lapsing and it's there, it still isn't spent because it has to go to government and council for approval. They still then at that point would have the latitude to decide what the state can do under the economic conditions. But the fact that we're closing the gap and, wait, and not waiting for a next session of legislatures with possible new changes of legislation, not understanding the program, uh, not not putting the money forward, you have that time frame. And in that time frame, municipalities are bound in health to make those payments, whether the state money is there or not. And that's what we've been facing for a long time. It's been a magnificent unanimous support last session, both in House Finance, in the House, and in the full Senate to support this. But I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can clarify the non-lapsing as Representative Buco understands it and brought forward in this amendment. And then in conclusion, uh, Senator Rashardi I've been working with has filed Senate Bill 230, which 
was filed after this bill in the non-lapsing part is in there. If you look at the language of SB 230, uh, it's, it's also describes that the non-lapsing means that any money that doesn't go to the efficiency budget, which the DES calls a maintenance budget, can be brought forward and then can be used to reward new projects according to the <laughs> approval of governor and council. It takes the DES out of the politics of the money. It puts it in the hands of the governor and the council, whether they want to cut the money or because they don't have it. Uh, but the people passing those bonds can start to have a reliable feeling that the state is a, is a solid partner. And then I should point out too that as far as the 20 or 30 percent, uh, all the projects we that we did in North Conway, uh, we we already had our, our debt, our, our rate pay, three times the state average. I think it is. There's a certain average of your rates that once it hits that level, you're eligible for the 30 percent. I've stood in front of the people voting on the bonds and said, raise your rates to the level of, of unaffordability and then you get an extra 10%. And then you've got skin in the game because in the New Hampshire Trust Fund, they all say, we want it skin in the game. So now the locals raise their rates because they're gonna have to anyway to, to pay the construction. But why not raise it and pay as much as you can on rates and get 10% more on the long-term uh, partnership with the state. So that's a strategy, whether they do it locally or not, it's up to them. But, but the, the local government, the local municipalities, are more than willing to do what the regulatory drivers are ordering them to. They only ask that it's affordable. And what makes it affordable? The formulas of the state and federal government. Municipalities at the local level are willing to accept those affordable formulas. So we're not trying to dictate anything. We're trying to, by the, by the state and federal formulas, make it affordable with a state aid grant program. It's solid program, it's a solid partnership, uh, and we can do much that has to be done within the state rivers, water protection, lakes protections, uh, in conjunction with uh, forests. It's it just all one thing. But the essence of water depends on this uh, state aid grant if you want a lot of construction to occur. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for the opportunity to, have, to give that long dissertation. Thanks, Bill. Seeing no further questions, uh, the pleasure of the division concerning 311. We'll uh, hold on to it and uh, see what the budget looks like, Tom. How, how will I go about um, you know, having this amendment uh, attached? Just give that to Mr. Hoffman, if you would. And yeah, and we can take that up at a later date. Thanks. Wow, right on time almost. Uh, we'll be back here at one o'clock. So you're free to take an extended lunch.
just take a few minutes. There's a lot of handouts that have come up. We're just kind of going through them first. Well, someone's already made sure that they've given us quite a few, but uh, you can certainly wait until we're ready. Thanks. Okay. Also, flipping around. This is the coming up a hill thing. Is the or it's well, I think this is under the road, but it's like an existing bridge in this picture. All right, Representative Pearson. Uh, this is House Bill 506 uh, relative to the construction of a rail trail box tunnel on exit 4A in Derry and making an appropriation thereof. Or therefore. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of Finance Division 1, for the record, Rep Representative Steve Pearson, Rockingham District 13, which encompasses the town of Derry. When I turned six, six years old, they started talking about the construction of Exit 4A. A lot has happened since I was six. And for the most part, what hadn't happened was anything to do with Exit 4A. Delay, delay, delay. The Department of Transportation has delayed this project in some form or another since 1982. So fast forward to a couple years ago, and things really start kind of jumping into gear here. So I'm not going to touch on the te technical aspects of it. I have people behind me that are here to do that. What I'm going to talk about is, is my town, Derry. In the last two years, I've had 34 meetings, 34 meetings with stakeholder groups, the Department of Transportation, handicapped folks, and the like on this issue. For the most part, up until recently, the plans that were presented to the folks in my town involved a tunnel that just went under six lanes of traffic. It's a logical thing to do. It, it's done in many, many locations throughout the state. And then, out of the blue, and a concept came out with this spaghetti thing that you guys are looking at. We never actually had an official public hearing until September of 2022 to discuss this. At this point, it was really just a dictation to the, my constituents, and it wasn't really a public hearing. So you can imagine the shock and surprise of the leaders of, at the town level and the state level when you have something that's gone forward for a long time with pretty much the same way. And then all of a sudden, an alternative idea comes about. One of the other things that I'd like to address before we start getting heavy into this is an apology to this committee. During last week, when the Speaker's Office sent out a series of emails in reference to the rescheduling of hearings due to inclement weather, the work session notification for this day was included in a in the series of emails that went out. Myself and several others were under the impression that the public hearing had been rescheduled to today. That is why you did not see very many folks at the public hearing, despite hundreds of people that had signed in on the blue sheet. So that's kind of the situation we're in today, and I, again, would apologize to the committee for that mistake. But during that testimony, the Department of Transportation decided to represent the opinion of the town of Derry, and they did not do so correctly. 
So much so that the chairman of the town council has sent me something to read. And he is not happy. So I will, if it's okay with you, I will read what, what the chairman of the town council said, as I think this is extraordinarily relevant to our circumstances. And I will get you with this in, in writing form. Hi, my name is Josh Borden. I'm the Dairy Town Council at Large and Chairman, finishing my ninth year. First, I'd like to thank you all for your service and recognizing my testimony. I would be there in person, but I am teaching political science at Wyndham High School. Second, in the, in the words in this letter are mine and not reflective of my colleagues on the council. I was disappointed to hear some of the testimony being given by the DOT during Representative Pearson's bill hearing on the rail trail tunnel. The fact is I never voted in favor of the alternative scenic route plan. Approximately one month prior to our vote, I called for a meeting with Representative Pearson, Town Manager Dave Karen, members of the DOT, and Vice Chair Aaron Spencer, Town Council Vice Chair Aaron Spencer, to ask questions about each of the plans, tunnel versus the alternative, the cost to dairy taxpayers, and potential delays. I heard from hundreds of constituents regarding their desire for the tunnel. The only time that I have seen the community this fired up was when a radical counselor closed a fire station. During the meeting with the DOT, I was assured of three things. One, they wanted the town to be happy with the end result. Two, the dairy taxpayer would not have to pay for the tunnel if we chose to go that route. And three, there would be delays to the project likely lasting six months to a year. After hearing this, I felt it was my obligation to my colleagues as well as the constituents to agendize this item and bring forward a vote on whether the town council supported the, scene, the tunnel or scenic route. To my dismay, the town received a letter a few days prior to the vote. In a nutshell, the letter stated that the town would likely have to pay the cost of the tunnel. The DOT reversed their decision. As chairman, I was infuriated with the confusion and reversal. The council had always said that they were not willing or able to spend more money on the exit 4A project beyond our $5 million obligation. I, we, per public testimony, were indifferent on the rail trail plans if we were to pay. However, if we were given the choice to upshift the cost, then the tunnel may have passed. In my opinion, the vote that we eventually took said that we were indifferent with the current terms and would not take the risk of having to pay for a tunnel. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened had the DOT not reversed their stance. I am personally asking you to value the safety of the residents, tourists from all over the world who will be using this trail, value the economics of a vibrant, well-built rail trail, and to support funding the tunnel. I am always willing to wait for something that will, better my, will be better for my community and the state we share. Thank you, Josh Borden, Chairman of the Dairy Town Council. One of the things that happened in the history of this was that the, t the towns of Derry and London Derry signed a contract with the state. It's a single document signed by both towns indicating their financial obligation. The town of Derry fl floated a bond to pay for that $5 million that was, that was conducted years ago. So to have the Department of Transportation send a threatening letter, and that's what it was, it was a threat, to the Derry Town Council for them not to interfere with what the DOT was doing, otherwise there would be financial penalties involved, I think was unethical. It violated the conditions of the contract and is certainly nothing I had ever seen before from state government at, down to the local level. We're in a peculiar situation here. If you go up and down 93 and you get off an exit, you exit onto a state road, right? Exit four is 102, exit three is 111. But in this particular case, exit 4A exits onto town roads. So the circumstances of what you would, I would consider a normal type of exit where the Department of Transportation controls both the highway and the road that it exits onto is not the case here. So it, it's, it's, a, it's an avenue that I think was confusing for folks. It's been confusing for me as to how, where that separation is and who is allowed to do what and who controls what. But we're well into the town of Derry by the time you get to this railroad bed. 
The rail trail in Derry has been, through the efforts of a lot of volunteers, become a very popular part of a, a state trail system. It's paved for the most part. It's, and uh, the University of New Hampshire has done usage studies. It is heavily used, and rightly so. You have a, a great walking path. It's safe. You, very little interactions with automobiles. It's a place where you can bring pets, kids in strollers, bikes, that sort of thing. We actually have two businesses in Derry that have popped up because of the trail. That's how popular it is. So when this came about, when we looked at this, immediate concerns came up because the design requires a crosswalk across six lanes of traffic. Now, folks have a tendency to kind of just go the straight path. And this alternative plan that you see here goes so far out of the way that the logical move is I'm just going to hit a button and I'm going to do the Frogger thing and I'm going to go across six lanes of traffic to continue on to the other side. The town council doesn't want it. The town manager doesn't want it. I, as a 27-year safety professional, don't like it. And I look at this and I say, okay, what's the logical move here? What's been done in other places? And it's simply been a concrete box tunnel. The concrete box tunnel is so small, it's not even big enough to fit in the finance room. That's how, that's how small this tunnel is. It's not big at all. But the idea here is to replace it with almost a quarter mile of pavement that runs at, a, that, at angles that are on the cusp of ADA compliance that are in one side, almost two football fields in length, and that goes runs along a brook that's flooded, massively flooded three times in my lifetime. I grew up in Derry. So this whole thing doesn't even pass the sniff test. It's illogical. It's not good for the the rail trail system itself. It's gonna. I don't even know what it's gonna do to the race that we hold. We hold a a running race, a charity race on the rail trail. I don't know how that's going to work. I'm very concerned about the interactions between bicyclists and pedestrians. I'm, in, I'm very concerned about blind corners. In, in an amazing bit of, I won't call it hypocrisy because I don't know that it's that, but in, by comparison, the Department of Transportation had concerns about the slope of the road over the box tunnel. And they were concerned at the six, six and seven degree mark in an automobile but they don't seem to be concerned about a pedestrian at five degrees. So we worked with them, shaved a foot off the top of it, and got those numbers into a satisfactory range for the road travel. But the reality here is when the last tail light from a DOT dump truck drives away from this project, this is on the town of Derry. We're gonna have to maintain it. We're gonna have to fix it when it has damage. And we're going to have to deal with the repercussions of a, a design that is highly flawed. So the simple answer was just, hey, the federal government was given this plan years ago, and they approved it. The federal government approved the box tunnel. It met the criteria. It met their safety concerns. They gave it the green light. The plan before you is not approved by the feds. And as of last discussion with the feds, they haven't even seen it. In the August 23rd meeting with the Department of Transportation that I attended, I was told, well, if we have the money, it's all about money. If we have the money, we'll build the tunnel. Well, that's why we're here. Because we're asking the state, as part of this highway project, to appropriate the money to make this happen. This is something the town of Derry is going to have to live with for decades, if not 100 years. These box tunnels have huge lifespans. To undo this later would be millions of dollars. As you are all aware, the time to make the proper modifications to things is during the construction phase. So when I get a letter from the university, a division in the University of New Hampshire that deals with outdoor recreation for handicapped folks that's telling me that this isn't workable, 
when I have concerns from runners that I went to high school with that have safety concerns about going under a bridge into a blind corner, and when I have folks in my town that use this to go out with their kids, and they're telling me what's going on with this, I, I have no option. I have to speak up. So I'll, I am... I'm not going to get into any of the tech, technical aspects. There's folks here that will that will do that and give you a little bit different, you know, a little bit timeline as far as the the state groups and whatnot. But that's that's the dairy deal. Any questions for Representative Pearson, Representative Wild? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Pearson. Do you know how how many years this five million dollar um, bond has been paid off, and and how many more years to go? And my understanding is dairy's already paid it. It's done. We've we've paid we paid the Department of Transportation and then bonded it in the town. As far as the the town itself paying back the bond they took out to pay the DOT, I'm not aware of when that. But the DOT has been paid. That's that's what I've been told. Thank you. Yes, a good representative from Mont Vernon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, representative, what is the current situation with the rail trail? Is it is there no link there currently or what? Well, the currently the railroad bed is there. It's so that piece of railroad bed in Derry was used up until 1984. It's when I, you know, the uh, it was used for freight. Uh, the the last time passenger service was sometime in the 1950s, but it was used for for freight. Um, so the bed is all there. There's a couple of spots where they've had some little washouts and things like that, but nothing of nothing of consequence. But the the dairy rail trail folks the town of dairy have done improvements to this up until the point of 4a because there was no sense in doing any work in that area because we knew the highway project was coming through so it is paved it is it is done right up until the point of this construction project it's all ready to go follow up um, my question is what did the rail did the railroad cross the the street currently, uh, when it was in, it, it was at street level, there yes. was no tunnel. It was at street level, and there was a bridge, a wooden bridge that on Madden Road that went over the railroad bridge. That bridge was torn down in 86 yes, and just filled in with dirt. But Thank yes, it, it went across at, at, gra at grade, as they call it. Any questions over here? Uh, Representative McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. So do you have this um, uh, handout from DOT? I wanted to ask you some questions related. I've seen to... it so many times. I can okay. probably do it without it, but we can. So you said these are town roads. So Fols Folsom Road, North High Street, and Furlander, these are all town roads? Correct. Is that correct. But they're being reworked as part of this project? Correct. They are being reworked as part of the 4A project. This actually extends another, even more easterly down Folsom, it crosses not only Route 28, but it goes all the way down to Route 102. Substantial, this is a huge swath through the middle of my town. Okay, so we don't really have a picture of what it looks like today. Well, you have a picture in front of you of the area of concern here, where this, where the tunnel would, the box tunnel would go through. I did hear you over here, you asked Representative Leishman about what's the box with the slashes. Those are businesses that have been eliminated due to this project. We've lost 13 businesses in Derry because of this exit construction. So that's those are structures that are being torn down. Um, one of which was only is only like nine years old. Okay, yeah. so now you made the statement that people will be crossing five lanes of traffic. Mm -hmm. I don't see that on this map. So on the left hand side where you see the building that's being removed, that gray area is the railroad bed. Okay, so as a result, there is going to be a crosswalk on Folsom Road where it comes to that intersection. And that's the, unfortunately, the sidewalks and the rail bed are both gray. So it's hard to, you're not necessarily zoom. I guess on the, maybe on the right hand side, that would probably be better. You can, that, where, it jet, where you come north on High Street, and you have what looks like a bit of a triangle where it slopes to the right. That little jot to the left that goes across there, 
that's where there will be a, they're going to have to put a crosswalk across that six lanes of traffic. So that's where you want the rail trail. Yes. Well, that's where the rail, that's where the railroad bed pretty much is. And the tunnel would, would go underneath that. Okay. Yeah. So, but I understand that, that if you go to the right mm -hmm. with the loop around and so on, that loop around goes under the Folsom Road. Yeah? It goes underneath a bridge that would have to be lengthened in order to accommodate it. Yes. Okay, but that bridge work is being done it, th as part of the same. All of this project. is in a design phase. None of this even goes out to bid at earliest October. So this we're we're not they're not bidding any of this out yet. I guess my point is people are not required to cross Folsom Road. No. Nope. On top, they can go underneath. They could, but you're all, right keep keep in the, mind you're looking at a flat map with no gradient. No, I mean there's a picture here. That's the underneath. Yep. Yeah. You don't really get a sense of grade from this either. All you're getting there is just the very loop at the end. How you get to that is 530 feet of five degrees on one side and 430 feet back up on the other, which that photo really does not show you. Yeah. You're just seeing the loop that goes under the bridge. Sure. But, but I guess my point is if people didn't want to cross Folsom Road, they mm -hmm. could turn right. Mm-hmm take the loop, go underneath, and come back, yeah? They could, but you and I are both know that the natural tendency of people, when they're staring across six lanes and they see their destination on the other side, is it just they hit the button. We know we're going to have to deal with that. The town's already trying to figure out a way to prepare for that. I, I would personally, I would rather not see a crosswalk there, period. Okay. But... We're being told that it has to that it has to be put there. And could I have one more? Thank you. So you read something from Mr. Borden. Um, Borden. So I have an article here, and he's quoted as saying, um, so where is it here? Uh, Council Chairman Joshua Borden says he supports the trail systems across the state. But his decision, which is not to um, request this tunnel, um, was based on the taxpayers, on protecting the taxpayers' wallets the best he can. It is unfortunate, unfortunate to having to choose between spending money and not spending money. Um, and I wanted the tunnel. I thought it made sense. We just can't, we can't just add a tunnel with the delays and without the potential cost to our voters. Uh, that was a no-go for me from day one. Mm -hmm. So He's referring to the town of Derry's hook on this. Yes. So so apparently he wants the tunnel, but not enough for Derry to spend its own money for it. Because but, the town of Derry... But to spend my constituents' money, he's happy for that. Is because that right? the town of Derry entered into a contract with the state that outlined what they would be required to pay. And it, when that contract was entered into, the design elements included that tunnel. This is a change post-contract. Do, do you have documentation on that? Of the contract? Yeah. I can send it to you, sure. Okay. No problem. Yep. That's a $5 million bond. That's the $5 million that Dairy and London Dairy were both required to pay. Yep. It's a single document that both towns signed. signed. For other questions, I have a couple. Sure. So I'm looking on the cover sheet here that we've been looking at and to the plan to the right, and I see uh, what looks to be kind of spaghetti-ish that goes around and it says rail trail and that tiny little, you can just barely make it out. Um, Oh boy. And that really, yeah, <laughs> Where, it's, it's on the upper right hand side. It's under Shield oh, sure. Brook. Yep. That's. And it says rail trail. That's the proposed. That's really not. That's the not rail where it is. trail. It's, Correct. That's the proposed. Um, how the distance of that new proposal versus just putting the tunnel in? How many feet is 1,000 feet? Do you know? So the alternative is around just shy, I guess, of 
of a quarter mile. Um, the tunnel itself, like I said, is smaller than the finance room. It's it would fit inside it, so it's it's not uh, not a, it, it just goes under six lanes, the width of six lanes. So further to that. The town of Derry would be responsible for maintaining it, plowing it. What Absolutely. The town, like I said, when the final DOT dump truck drives away, the town of Derry is responsible not only for the rail trail, for all <clears> of it. <throat> These are town roads. So now what about the existing rail trail? Is that maintained by the Trails Bureau, the town of Derry? Who maintains so that? So the, the town of Derry has a rail trail um, committee, the, chair, the president of which is here today i will speak to you on on their specifics but the, that's a group of volunteers that maintain it in you know weeds and garbage and and all that stuff so um i've i've done work with them certainly over the years and um they're they're the ones that kind of just just do that they've raised they've raised all kinds of money for things over the years um to, but the state still owns that corridor, is that correct? The state owns oh, they... most of the corridor. Yes. Yep. Because I know when all these lines were abandoned under the law, the state had the first right to acquire the lines and then subsequently mm -hmm. has turned some of them over to the Trails Bureau, but the state of New Hampshire still owns the underlying property. That's the DOTs right. here, they could they could give you a better, a tighter explanation as to the ownership of Better than I can, but yeah, that's the generalized understanding is yes, yeah. The state, the state owns them; they're state property. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned that because New Hampshire has a state law, RC two eighty eight, that protects railroad beds that were in use after nineteen sixty nine. It protects the corridors of those for future commerce in the event that we ever have to put freight trains back. And if you've ever been out west, oh my God, they're everywhere, right? So this railroad bed, since it was last used in 1984, it is well documented. There were newspaper photos and articles when the last train came through Derry. It's certainly not up for dispute here. This particular railroad bed is a protected historic corridor. And I would argue that this entire design violates current state law as it is a protected historic corridor. And all efforts should be made to fit within RSA 288. And going way out of the way to which they're doing here does not do that. I guess that's where I was going. <clears throat> Further questions? I still have a few. Just want to make sure everyone. Oh, I'm Representative Hewitt. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly have any problem with, with uh, what the town of Derry would like to do as far as the rail trail is concerned. I think that's entirely your business. And, and frankly, I don't think it's any of the business of the Finance Committee. However, uh, there's, another, there's another issue that I don't want to get into now. I want, people are here to talk about the rail trail, and that's what I want them to talk about. Um, but I think everybody needs to understand that there is also another issue in here that, that implicates uh, the criminal law. And this uh, bill uh, uh, establishes a, the crime of uh, interfering with the construction of the rail trail. Um, the, and it creates a particular type of crime, a Class A misdemeanor. That, I think, is entirely within the, the jurisdiction of the judiciary. Sure. Right? And I don't think that the Finance Committee has any business uh, in, engaging in a dis decision to uh, to to support an, I, an idea, a good idea, um, but to make it a crime to oppose it. So Representative Stapleton filed an amendment that removes that it out in its entirety. Ah, well, I haven't seen that amendment. So it was it was requested by OLS to be present here for this work session. Do we have that, Mr. Hoffman? I believe Representative um, <clears throat> Stapleton did send a copy to all of us, but it's technically not to us until it goes through the Correct. LBA. So <laughs> there we go. And that's fine. <clears throat> that, that's fine. I, I just wanted to make sure that everybody sure. understood yep. that that was an, that was an issue and has nothing to do with what they're talking about.
Thanks, Michael. Thank you for bringing that up, Representative. I, I presume that I shouldn't have. I presume that you guys had seen that. Thank you, sir. So Representative Pearson, while they're looking at that, I have a few sure. more questions as I continue to look at this. Um, so you said the hashed out areas were buildings that have been or are to be removed. Correct. And who came up with the design to put the uh, trail is proposed on the far right side the alternative rail trail was that the so state interestingly or the enough or? a bidder a competitive bidder during the original bid build process i believe they call it that has been abandoned by the dot in an attempt to get an unfair advantage on the other bidders came up with another design they invented this thing so the other two groups that were bidding on this, it wasn't an apples to apples bid. They su submitted an alternative plan. And how that plan came about, the president of the rail trail can tell you, I think, frankly, to float a theory and then issue a gag order on someone and then use it as part of a bidding process is unethical. That's the impetus of that mess. And, it, and as, a, as a member, which I did not disclose, as a member of the board of directors of Dairy's Rail Trail, I, wasn't, I never saw this. I never approved this. I never agreed to this because a, an engineering firm issued a gag order to prevent the discussion of it. Well, you've certainly raised a lot of uh, sensitive issues, I guess, to put it mildly. So I, unless anyone has any further questions, I, oh, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One more question. Uh, part of your justification is that we need to keep that right away open mm -hmm. in case we ever decide to put a railroad there again. How high is the box tunnel, and would the box tunnel handle a freight car or a locomotive yeah. going through it? So the box tunnel's original design was at 12 feet. The uh, the compromise, if you will, to lower the pitch of the Madden Road over the top of it is at 11 feet. If the railroad decides to go through, there will be substantial modifications to this railroad bed anyway, um, in which time they the railroad can lower the grade the bottom of this thing they wouldn't have to they wouldn't have to take it out they could just lower the floor um, the subsequent tunnels north of there in Londonderry were all constructed to railroad standard so Londonderry has tunnels on this on this railroad bed to railroad standard but some in Wyndham has railroad standard tunnels under a road that does not necessarily connect to this rail trail, but to a different one. But somehow that's okay for every other community, but not mine. And to and to, and I feel as though Representative McGuire didn't totally answer one of your questions, and I'll and I'll do it this way, in the sense that this is a federal highway project. So as far as your constituents, there's a lot of constituents, I suppose, that pay for a federal highway project because it's. It comes out of the federal, there's federal dollars involved and there's state dollars involved as well. So this is not something that's unique and standalone in the sense of the town of Derry asking for this. This is encompassing a federal highway, $125 million federal highway project. So it's, you know, when, when you're going to cut a swath through the middle of my town, I expect that it's done in a way that doesn't hurt my constituents is part of the way they design this project. So depending on how you want to look at the dollars, it's that's where this 
that's how this thing is framed here as part of a federal highway project. So you're making it sound as though the federal government is imposing this project on your town, but your town paid $5 million, as did the neighboring town, mm -hmm. because they want this project. Correct. They were, and again, they were, after they signed that contract, changes have been made. So, as, right, that's, that's not shocking or new or anything. I mean, it's, you know, federal highway projects, all kinds of projects develop over time, but it, it's not the same. It's interesting, uh, following up on Representative Griffin's question, because the widening of 93 to the north through London Dairy, they built a highway bridge over the rail trail, a significant crossing with a bridge. So anyway, well, we'll get you off the hook for a little while and maybe sure. someone else would like to come. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Ebel has a question. Sorry, there may be Oh, no, not a here. problem. Um, well, I have the article also when they talked about the decision by the council, I guess, uh, not to recommend I'm looking at, and so they were concerned about the expenses, mm -hmm. but I'm referring back to the quote that Representative McGuire read. And if you continue through, not only were they, uh, the council members concerned about the expenses, they were also concerned about the delay aspect. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you could comment on that, because obviously mm -hmm. to make this change would also cause a delay. So the delay, the, de the parameters of that delay are up for significant debate here. The Department of Transportation has been well aware of the objections of stakeholder groups for this going almost on two years now. The VHB, whose symbol is on the bottom of this page, provided a design for that tunnel several years ago. So what I was told by the project manager was it's about slope and drainage issues. This doesn't go out to bid until October at the earliest. We have engineers at the DOT that can do what needs to be done here. This, this shouldn't take till October to do to design slope and drain issues around a, an element that was in the original design to start with. So I, I, I question that. I question the, the length to which they claim a delay would occur here for when they still have 100 properties to acquire that still have not been acquired to do this, this phase of the project when the DOT itself has delayed this project dozens of times since 1982, and they've been aware of the objections to this for two years. Who's really, where are the delays really coming from here? It's not, it's not from the rail trail. Further question. And I just want to be clear, uh, you're basically asserting that the design that's being proposed by DOT at this point is not safe? As a safety professional for 27 years and someone with an engineering degree in the practice, I will tell you there are two elements that are definitely not safe about this. And that predominantly has to do with the way that the rail trail has line of sight coming down from the Londonderry end under that bridge. And as someone who predominantly rides a bicycle on those with a five degree slope on that end, we're going to have collisions at that point where that where that makes the turn under the bridge. It's you you just can't see you don't know who's under the bridge when you're coming down that down that hill, and that that's not a matter of if it's going to happen. So I I don't want to see that ever happen. I don't want to see anybody ever get wiped out here. And the design of this by itself lends to that. Not only does it. Is that my opinion? But we have, through a 91A request, internal documents that I would hope one of the people behind me has from internally within the DOT, they have questioned the safety of this. So safety is a huge factor. Safety is also a huge factor in federal approval, which this doesn't have. So, you know, I... This really needs, um, I'm hoping the federal, the federal folks that are responsible for approving this take a real hard look at the safety aspect of this because I have real concerns on the way that they've, they've done this. 
All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. You're Chairman. You're well represented of your town, for sure. Um, now, sir, I, I assume that you would like to speak. I would. And if you could state your name I and will. spell your last name if it's difficult, please. <laughs> it's Connors. It's an Irish name. I think you, as long as you get the O in the end instead of the E, you're good. I'm going to pass around some handouts as well. Um, unfortunately, my color printer ran out of ink because I did these at home last night. So some of you are getting color, some of you are getting black and white. But we just can look at each other's if we get to a color point. So uh, I don't have the resources of the DOT to, to do the big color prints and all that. I was prepared to show you guys a PowerPoint, though, because I work in sales and I thought you might have some projection equipment. So this is done on a PowerPoint. I apologize also for the size Thought we might be looking at this on a projector. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and members of this committee for uh, having us and allowing us to testify, especially given the, uh, the, the, uh, that we, uh, some of us missed last week. We thought this was the reschedule, not, not a committee meeting, so it would have been nice to speak to the larger group as well. Um, my name is Mark Connors. I am the president of the Dairy Rail Trail Alliance. I am also a member of the Granite State uh, Rail Trail those are two volunteer positions uh, that take a lot of my time in addition to my job in selling software to large universities, nonprofits, and hospitals. Um, I've been a member of the board of the Dairy Rail Trail Alliance since 2007. I moved to Dairy in 2004. Uh, the reason I got involved in this at all was uh, I had small children at that time and took them for a ride on the Wyndham Rail Trail, and you'll hear from the president of the Wyndham Rail Trail in a little bit. They had a beautifully new paved rail trail, um, including a wonderful bridge over the new Route 111 that had been blasted through at that time, which you'll see some photos of that in my you know, deck. Um, so the whole idea of a rail trail coming into Derry uh, jumped up. There was a gentleman named Eric Whitney who started the Derry Rail Trail Alliance. I joined with him and we quickly formed a nonprofit organization and said, we have to do what Wyndham has done and extend this up to Derry and through Derry uh, on to uh, London Derry. So that's how I got involved in this and I've been there ever since. Now the first trip I ever took on the rail trail, my kids were on single speed bikes. They were five, six. They are now graduated and out of college and I'm still trying to get this rail trail done in Derry. Um, we had the first sections going from downtown Derry all the way down to Wyndham done in a matter of a couple of years because we were able to raise the money, work with the town of Derry. We had a great partnership. Uh, the, the citizens stood up and uh, we got those, those, uh, that version done. Since then, we have been at loggerheads and getting to London Derry because of the exit for a project and the continuous delays um, so we have been patient. We have been working with the, DO, with the DOT, with our town DPW, trying to get everything aligned for the rail trail to go north and connect to Londonderry. Londonderry also has four miles of paved trail now leading to the airport, and it is now connecting into Manchester. And very soon, the entire Granite State Rail Trail, hopefully in the next few years, will span from the Massachusetts border in Salem all the way to Lebanon and the Vermont border. There are over 50 miles of the rail trail already complete from Lebanon south to just north of Concord. The state, uh, you guys have just appropriated some new purchases and things within Concord to get your rail trail here in Concord, and that is going to connect. Um, so anyway, I uh, signed up for the rail trail as just a volunteer thinking, yeah, I'll, we'll get this thing done. Um, when Exit 4A started to become an issue with how we were going to get the rail trail through there, when we realized the Exit 4A connector road was going to bisect the rail trail and basically cut it off, um, we started to get a little bit involved in politics and working with the DOT. I signed up as a consulting partner on the Exit 4A project in order to be informed of everything that the DOT designed by their own rules. I'm supposed to get all their documents. I'm supposed to get all their information in order to make sure that we were represented that's been a little bit touch and go um, as to how that actually has taken. So anyway, this has been a long and winding road to this point, and it looks like you know, the map in front of you at this point with as many curves as the new DRTA plan. Simply stated, if you, you, you put that map, you take all the stuff off of the maps that, that are in front of you, and you put this in front of a third grader and say, you gotta go from point A to point B, which way are you gonna go? 100% of the people are gonna go across the rail trail, straight. A rail trail by design, if you look up a, you know, a rail trail is supposed to follow an old rail corridor. It's supposed to be flat. 
there's this is not a rail trail anymore. Once DOT puts this in, this is no longer a rail trail by design. It, and they've even referred to it as a nice local recreational path and so on and so forth. No, this is part of the alternative transportation corridor, which has actually been required of the DOT since the beginning of I-93. And the first several pages that I've included uh, in the document come from the Rizzo study from back in 2003. And again, I apologize for the smaller type. Uh, that you see there, but these documents are still available out on DOT's own page, and I encourage you to go out and actually read the documents there. So in order to get the approval for I-93 widening, the DOT had to include an alternative transportation plan and corridor. And so they spent a lot of money on this study, which is you know very detailed, and they hired groups and so on and so forth, and their own plan calls for this alternative transportation corridor. If you read through the documents, it identifies the MNL branch, the Manchester to Lawrence branch of the rail trail as the most inexpensive, the right alternative. They were also thinking of running a rail trail up the middle of 93 or something as well. So they actually designed and came up with the idea of this rail trail. The problem was they never funded it. Unfortunately, DOT in New Hampshire is really focused on automobile transportation versus alternative transportation. And that really is at the root of some of this problem. We need transportation of all types. So if you read the own report, that went back to 2003 that the DOT spent a lot of money on, UNH and everybody else was involved, and I've highlighted a few names on the uh, people who are involved in that. You'll notice one of the names is William Cass. Our current commissioner of the DOT was on this original study plan, as was Mr. Mark Sampsel, who's sitting in the back of the room, who will talk to you from Wyndham Rail Trail in a little while, and several other folks were involved from the community related to bicycling and alternative transportation and rail trails. And they came up with this whole plan and one of the things that, call, that I call out on this page is that the reason they called it out is because it has a flat less than 2% grade. If you read some of the other details, that is accessible to all people, including disabled people, people in wheelchairs, walkers, elderly, which is a huge part of the people that you will see on our Dairy Rail Trail every day. People rehabilitating injuries, heart attacks, walkers. It, it's a wonderful mix of people parents with strollers, so on and so forth. And that's the idea behind a rail trail is to create community. It also is the lowest cost alternative that was come up by the DOT. Now again, this was 2003. The entire 4A project at that point was supposed to cost $50 million. As I hope you all know, we're over $130 million now to get that same project done because of the delays. So just looking at that, it was ranked highest because of accessibility, natural resources, compatibility with the neighborhoods, connectivity to the cities, and links to our commuter centers. So you all know about the Exit 5 Transportation Center that DOT and the state has spent a huge amount of money on, one at Exit 2, one at Exit 3. Well, let me tell you something. A few years ago, to prove that alternative transportation is real, I rode my bike to work. I live in Derry, New Hampshire. I worked in Peabody, Massachusetts at the time. I rode my bike on the rail trail up to London Dairy's Transportation Center. I got on the bus with my bike. I went down to South Station, got off my bike, got off the you know bus at South Station, rode my bike across Boston to North Station, got on a train to Lynn, got off the train in Lynn, and rode my bike to Peabody. It can be done. I'm probably foolish for doing it, but I was trying to prove a point. So, th yeah, too long, <laughs> about three hours. It was a long commute. Won't do it again. Um, but just to point out, it is, this is supposed to be an alternate transportation. You'll also see on the uh, document for the Rizzo study that this talks about the fact that there will be public hearings, input, involvement of the community as DOT designs this alternative. And that is where a major failure has happened, unfortunately, in what is in front of you today. This is one of my first times getting involved in DOT and all that. And like I say, we had a pretty good partnership, I thought. Um, but DOT kind of just went off the rails and decided to go do their own thing without involving us. And I use that you know, term on purpose. Um, they just kind of came up with this alternative and, and, and I, will, I will touch on that. And then without enough public input, they decided that was the way they were going. And it all of a sudden showed up at a, here, at a public meeting as the only option. So the other slides that I've included, someone mentioned those bridges at exit four, five in Londonderry. This is the MNL corridor. So when DOT says, well, we're not really planning on trains coming back on this corridor, therefore we don't need to worry about keeping the corridor open. Well, why the heck, excuse me, did we spend tens of millions of dollars on four train size overpasses for this little paved path to go under there then? That's what we did. Tens of millions of dollars for those four bridges in Londonderry. In Wyndham, 
when they blasted the new 111, the pictures you have there are showing, when we put in that new 111, that didn't even exist. That road just became, you know, a brand new road. They had to keep the rail corridor open because our laws say you have to keep these corridors open for future rail potential. The likelihood of rail coming back does not matter. On this particular line, may not happen, but we are supposed to be doing that, especially when Representative Pearson mentions a line was used after, I believe, 1964 as live rail. It has to be maintained by our own laws. Putting this highway in, and, and they knew this in Derry too, because when they, um, when they did take out the bridges that Mr. Uh, Pearson mentioned, there was a bridge at Folsom Road, an old one, old rickety wooden bridge like you see in different places. Um, they actually put in a six foot metal tunnel culvert. You can barely walk through it without whacking your head on it or anything. But they did that because they were required to keep the connectivity of that rail corridor. They could not just fill it in and put a road across it. We have the same thing at Bowers Road where another bridge was replaced. They had to put a culvert in there in the 80s in order to comply with the law. So for them to just blast this and cover up the rail bed now is not kosher. Uh, you have laws against it and you guys can go and find them. We can point them out to you. I'll also say that you know the DOT keeps pointing to this being a financial question. Well, I just showed you how much money we spent in Wyndham, how much money we spent in Londonderry on the same trail. Well, here's another butte, 93. If you go to mile marker 8.6, get out of your car and walk off the side of the road. The DOT spent millions to put a box culvert under both sides of 93 just about three years ago. You know, for what? A rail trail that doesn't exist a future rail trail that because there's a rail bed there they had to keep it open they had to put the tunnel in and they did so this tunnel exists and probably two or three people a week use it to walk through because they live on one side of the 93 or the other millions for that tunnel but now we are here because of a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar difference between building this crazy alternative that sends people down a five percent grade under a bridge 90 degree turn across two driveways across the street and on a downhill slope. So I hearken back to when I took my little kids for the first ride on their rail trail. Why did I love it? They could just ride and I didn't have to worry about them. They could get up 100 feet ahead of me. There was no crossings, there was nothing. You got a kid on a little bike with a mom pushing a stroller with the other kid and the little kid starts getting going down that hill. He's going across two people's driveway who are backing out and he's got to come to that Furlan Street, go across the street take a 90 degree turn, go down another slope that's just under ADA at just under 5%, do a 180 degree button hook loop, come back down the slope to the stream level, and then shoot under a bridge, as Mr. Pearson said, where there's people coming at 18 to 20 miles an hour the other way in darkness or under a bridge. Maybe it's not dark, but under a bridge. This is accidents waiting to happen. The Dairy Fire Department is gonna be spending, they might as well just post a truck out there if this thing goes through. So. Someone asked, I think it was Rep. McGuire, finances. Why is this in front of the Finance Committee? Quite honestly, I wish this never got in front of our town council and they never had to take the vote. I personally, as a consultant on this project, the DRTA, the New Hampshire Rail Trails Coalition, the Granite State Rail Trails, Bike Walk Alliance in New Hampshire has been pleading with DOT to work with them, to come up with a solution. We've been shut out. They won't do it. We've heard, and again, anecdotally, I hope you guys can look into it, that the DOT's own safety department has not been allowed to look at or comment publicly on this plan. They hadn't even seen it. Someone mentioned national resor natural resources. The MNL corridor is a historic corridor. So forget all the rail trail stuff, even if this wasn't an active rail after 1964, it's a historic corridor that also has to be kept intact. And in fact, the approval for I-93 and the exit 4A got credits from the federal government and positive upticks in order for them to even do this whole 93 widening and exit 4A project because of what they put in the plan. Because they said, we're gonna build a beautiful rail trail and we're actually gonna build these wing walls that are gonna have a historic representation of what the rail used to look like. And so they sold this thing to Natural Resources and the New Hampshire Historical Preservation Society. Those folks also haven't said okay to this plan yet. That's one of the reasons it hasn't gone to the feds is they still haven't got the approval of those people because they said, wait, wait a minute, you said you were keeping the corridor open. So please do your homework on this thing. Now, finance, let's get to the money because I don't want to keep you guys all day. I could talk about this for months. So DOT also uh, 
did a study. I think it came out this August or past August, August 2022. And again, there's a picture of it, but you guys can go online and you can see the whole thing. Commissioned by the DOT, again, spent a bunch of money on this. Over $18 million annually is coming to New Hampshire because of the rail trails. 7.5 million of that is coming from the Derry, Wyndham, Londonderry sections of the existing trail. 7.5 million. And we're talking, we're quabbling over a $750,000 tunnel on a $130 million project after they've spent millions on all these other tunnels. This makes no sense to me. Quite honestly, for a while, I figured there had to be something going on behind the scenes. Someone wasn't telling us the whole deal. Someone had their finger in the pie. Something not kosher was going on. DOT's proven to us that no, that's not the case. There, there's no backroom deals. There's nothing. We just don't want to spend $750,000 for the safest, best alternative in dairy. That's what they've said. That's their only argument. So again, just pointing to their own report, Senate Bill 185 adopted in 2019 is an act to uh, develop New Hampshire state rail trails. And in that act, it actually talks about the preservation of important investment corridors. Again, so they were thinking about rail trails. We're not anti-rail. Some people have said, oh, you know what they should be doing is bringing back the trains. Absolutely, if you can bring back a train, most people on rail trails don't have a problem. We can do rail with trail. We're not against the trains coming back. In fact, when Woodmont Commons, uh, which is the big uh, exit 4A project um, up there, when they did their charrettes 10 years ago, I was there. I went over to the apple orchard and sat in their building. You know what was planned just north of this tunnel? A train station, because they were doing a multimodal approach. And again, when they sold their product project, there was gonna be a train coming up here so that people could commute from Woodmont to Boston. And there was a beautiful train station planned. We've been working with Woodmont and their folks all along too. In fact, Woodmont owns some of the rail beds. Someone asked about the ownership of the rail bed, not Woodmont, but people uh, in, involved in the project own part of the rail bed. They've already agreed to turn it over to Derry and London Derry in order for the rail trail to be built once exit 4A is complete. Everybody is on board. This rail trail is gold. So the other thing that I'll point to is the economic impact study within that New Hampshire Rail Trails Coalition uh, report. This is again, DOT numbers, they did it. So almost 19 million raised, 7.5. Uh, I think eight of it or uh, was it uh, four of it is coming from tourism. I will tell you personally, we, this trail is on the international bike path uh, plan. I've had people from Germany, Sweden, England, Canada stay in my house because I've run into them riding on the rail trail with their fully loaded bikes. And they're like, hey, where do we stay? Where can we camp? Where are the hostels on this trail? We don't have any yet, but come on, stay with me. So this trail is bringing people from all around the world. Other states, if you go to Wisconsin, look at Wisconsin, you look at Maryland, there's the Cumberland, Maryland trail that goes from Pittsburgh into Maryland, $100 million or more in revenue every year attributed to that 100 mile trail. That is the vision for New Hampshire. That is what we are trying to build is this Granite State Rail Trail. We've only got the gap between Concord and Manchester left once we get this debacle with 4A squared away because we have one mile to pave between us and Londonderry we're ready to do that as soon as this tunnel is done. And then you've got a trail that runs from Massachusetts all the way to Manchester already paved. So we're gonna need your help a little bit more than just this. I'm, I'm hoping that you folks are getting educated on the whole rail trail and Granite State rail trail concept too, because I would love for this to move forward. Get this tunnel built. It's a no brainer, as I say in my final slides, this should never have gotten this far. It's a waste of people's time. $750,000 is an investment I would say for one child's life who might get hit by a car on that crazy alternative. I would also ask, we've been asking the question, how much has DOT spent for the last two and a half years developing and redeveloping and coming to these meetings and going to the public with this crazy alternative? I bet you it already pays for the tunnel. If you guys could get those numbers out of DOT, we'd appreciate it because they won't give them to us. Well, so not, not to, uh, I appreciate it. I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up with that. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you guys to build the tunnel okay. <laughs> Excuse me. and ask any questions you want. Are there any questions? Uh, Cause I'm sure we'll have a few more with, I'd like to, uh, if there are no questions, I'd like to have a representative from the DOT come up cause we've heard some, uh, thank you. Pretty interesting testimony and. There's a lot of interesting things that I've been reading up here as well. So I'd like to get your comment on where things stand. 
And if you could introduce yourself sure. and spell your last name, if sure. you need Peter to. Stamness, Director of Project Development for DOT, uh, S, T is in Thomas, A, M, N, A, S is in Sam. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Director of Project Development. I oversee the highway and bridge programs for, uh, across the state, projects through the 10-year plan. I, I um trying to figure out where where to start um from a from a from a presentation standpoint. Um I think I'd like to start initially um by um clarifying a few um things that were said about the project in general. Um and then maybe I can go into um I think they explained the the, the details of the of the uh, various options, um, you know, I don't know that we need to go through that, but but I'd at least like to 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 clarify some of the things that um, I think uh, may um, may have been uh, misstated in some way. So the four A project, this project is a is a was a, is a town of London dairy and dairy project. So it had been from the beginning. Back in 2014, the contract that you heard about um, that was signed uh, uh, because there was difficulty by the municipalities to get this project delivered. So the DOT said that um, we'll we'll deliver this project. We're going to finish the design. We're going to engage consultants to complete the work, and um, we've capture your. Um, financial participation in this at the five million dollars that was um, for each town. So it's a town project. This is this this wasn't a DOT project. It was a town initiated project. They had advanced it through a public hearing, um, you know, back in early two thousands, and it sat for a while because of because of um, everything else that was going on at the time. So um, so I don't know if that's helpful for you, but um, um, this is this uh, the DOT um, is finishing the project for the municipalities of Derry and, and London Derry. Representative Hatchett, any of you that have a question during his presentation, feel free to wave at me and we'll take the question. Um, just for the characterization of what this project is, but it's also a, uh, isn't it an important link to the overall project as to what was spoken to previously. In other words, I don't think it would be a correct characterization to say that this is just a two-town project and very isolated. It's part of a oh. very important link um, throughout, or yeah, not. I, uh, please clear that up. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to um, um, intimate that. I, I, I was mainly, um, you know, uh, the, the commentary about the, the constant delays by the DOT um, from the beginning, it, no, it's a, it's an important project. It, it provides a, um, you know, it's a, a, a improves the economic development um, um, through the area and also provides some traffic relief uh, for exit four and and connections to uh, 102 to the west. So there's 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 value here, um, and I didn't mean to uh, um, make a statement that would suggest otherwise. So I have a follow-up to uh, Representative Hatch. You just said each town provided $5 million. Is that correct? That's yes. the first time I've heard it's like $10, $10 million now. It's not just the $5 million that Derry provided. Now, they contracted with the state DOT because the contract was referenced in the early, earlier discussion. So both London Dairy and Dairy signed a contract with the DOT to design and carry this project through? Is, yeah. It's a I... municipal agreement that we laid out um, conditions, um, who would pay what, who would be you know, making decisions, how we would coordinate decision making throughout um, the project and, and, and it laid out the, it was the groundwork for um, bringing the project to completion. Now we can get a copy of that contract. I'm sure it's available somewhere. Certainly. Certainly. Representative Ebel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So just so that we don't lose track of it, I mean, I come from a 
10 years on Public Works and Highways Committee, and there we have a 10-year plan that we work on every biennium. And so I have to assume that this is all part of many, many working pieces that are continuing for 4A, which has been a project that's been going on for a long time. So how does this fit into the 10-year plan process? <clears throat> So from a from a from a from a corridor project standpoint or this box culvert uh, discussion just from the I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's a huge planning process that's been going on with relationship to 93 and you've obviously thought about a lot of these working pieces and this is one of many that you've had to fit into a long range developing puzzle correct statement yes um, from a so this comes up um, every two years when we update the 10-year the plan. Um, uh, this project for a while had not been funded, and it, it, got, it got funded um, through the 10-year plan, and that's, that's our, that's our long-range plan uh, from, a, from a transportation. It's our work plan. It, it, you know, we travel around the state, um, generally um, 20 to 25 hearings uh, talking about important projects in, in um, um, each region. Um, it's overseen by the um, Executive Council, um, and it receives significant amount of public, public input overall. So this project and all the projects um, that are within the 10-year plan receive tremendous amount of public input, typically not down to the, the, the details about box culverts, but just in general, the value of the project, the, um, um, the purpose of the project, and, and, and what the outcomes um, would be um, when the project is completed. Thank you. So, so it's just, in some ways, it's hard to view it in isolation because it's part of a whole package that you're working on. Sure. Thank you. So I have one question, uh, kind of a follow-up to the whole funding scenario. Now, each town put the $5 million in, and this connector road, were there federal funds put in for that, state funds, local funds? Obviously, that this whole project is a lot more than $10 million. So what this whole redesign, do you know the cost of that redesign and carry through as far as the completion of the project? So the, the it's... Um... The construction cost estimate currently is around 104 million dollars, and it's all it's federally funded. So this is a this is federally funds. There are no uh, state funds involved. Um, we don't have a lot of state funds for transportation projects in in the state of New Hampshire. So this is a federally funded project, and the town's <clears throat> contribution, the five million dollar each, um, was um, you know part of part of the deal. Uh, again, it was a it was a municipal project to begin with, um, and I'm sure that there are probably uh, hours and hours of information that could be shared with you, not by me, at how how that how that came about the five million dollar. Um, I I can't go there. I'm sure there's there's there were lots of discussions about that, and probably a few lawyers involved. When you say part of the deal, um, is that the deal the put in this underpass tunnel, or I'm looking at this plan that we were just given, it's a little clearer to look at, or this, uh, I hate to use the word, but since it was used already, the spaghetti plan. Who came up with the spaghetti plan? Was that in the original contract to have a route that was somewhat removed from the existing rail corridor, or? Um, so um, the contract that you speak of, the agreement, uh, I don't believe made any mention of of the rail trail. It was specific to the delivery of the project and the costs associated with that. Who was going to prosecute the design? Who was the decision maker? How was that going to be communicated? Um, and I would, um, I don't believe the the decision to put a to put a a tunnel in um, was done prior to that contract. That 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 agreement. Um, we knew that the, the, the trail 
um, the, the railroad corridor, um, that the road that we were, that, that was planned to be constructed was going to bypass, was going to, was going to intersect that rail corridor. And we had to figure out a way, um, to, to accommodate that, that, uh, corridor. Um, so, you know, was it going to be an at grade crossing? Was it going to be a tunnel? Was it going to be some other grade separated, um, 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 crossing? You know that wasn't part. That wasn't that wasn't really included in the early in the early designs. I I, I would expect that there was probably some level of discussion about um, you know working towards a grade separated solution, which both of these alternatives are. They're both grade separated solutions. They both have five percent grades um, from the rail from the from from where the trail meets the the uh, the uh, the railroad corridor to get it under to get it under Folsom Road, both options have five percent down and five percent up. One's just a little bit longer than the other one. So I'm a little puzzled because I'm actually in the railroad business, so maybe I've got a disadvantage. But um, you say there's a five percent grade to take it under the road, but somebody testified earlier, I believe that there was a bridge there before that went over the rail grade. So the rail grade would not have a grade of 5%. It just doesn't work that way. That's correct. So the, so Folsom Road, and we're getting into, um, I was told to keep this simple, but it, I don't, this isn't well, really a, simple it stuff. See, it's Folsom simple, Road is, is, is probably 8 to 10 <clears> feet <throat> higher than the, than the, than the, than the uh, uh, railroad corridor. The, the the railroad bed. Okay, well, um, I do have a question. Representative McGuire had to leave, and he said, "Please ask the DOT about the contract." He states here, "Are we opening ourselves up to a lawsuit by Dairy to enforce the provisions of the contract with the tunnel plan?" So that's a question from Representative McGuire. Can you repeat the question again? I, I... sure. Are we opening up? to a lawsuit by the town of Derry to enforce the provisions of the contract with the tunnel plan. I, I, I don't think that the tunnel was included in the, in the, in the agreement that I'm talking about. I, I could be mistaken, but I don't believe it is. All right. Well, he had that question. So I'll ask, but I'll let you continue unless there are any further questions. And I'd like to caution everybody. We're already 45 minutes behind on our next hearing. We didn't anticipate I, this would become so involved to be honest with you i also have um, um copies of the um correspondence just to give um for, and I, i'd like to pass out copies of the correspondence between a sample of the correspondence between the dot and um uh, the town i'm going to keep one of these Mr. Chair, can I object on something? He was about to pass out a letter that wasn't sent to the DOT. It was sent to a private contractor while I was under a non-disclosure agreement. That's the letter he's going to pass you out. And I have a problem with that because I've never been released from that NDA. They aren't even supposed to have it. It went to a private company. Sweet. 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 We have to be cautious. If there was an objection raised, we just have an abundance of caution and hold off. The letter I passed out to the only letter that went from the DRT to the DOT. Letter formal correspondence between the cut and the DOT. Um, let's see, um, there was mention of, of, uh, the crosswalk and the direct route, um, between, um, um, that, that people wouldn't use the, um, um, the trail under the river bridge, the, the alternative concept, 
uh, the crosswalk, the surface crossing at Folsom Road um, would be there if we didn't have a rail trail crossing. It's it's necessary for the sidewalks at uh, to connect the sidewalk from the north side of Folsom Road to the south side of Fols Folsom Road. So whatever option, um, whatever option is chosen, whatever option is constructed, the crosswalk across Folsom Road will be there. It, it's it's not. It's not subject to um, uh, you know a decision of one one um, one option or or the other. Um, you know uh, the delays. Um, the we put our pencils down um, a while back as we got into uh, additional discussions um, over um, the alternatives. Um, we've we've encountered some delays. Um, um, if, if we um, change course again, there'll be more delays. Um, this is not, this design is not being completed by um, the DOT. Um, it's being completed by consultants hired by the DOT to prosecute the design. Um, it would require change orders um, and it will require uh, delays in overall delivery of the project. That's just the fact. Um, so um, for someone to suggest otherwise is just incorrect. Um, uh, I hate to put you on the spot, but I can't resist. I guess I'm taking a page out of the uh, Chairman Weiler playbook on this because I'm looking at, again, the proposed plan that shows a 5% grade, the, the alternative route that circles around, and again, I hate to use it again, spaghetti plan as it's been referred to. And to me, looking at that doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't. <laughs> when you have an existing rail corridor that used to connect Manchester with Lawrence, and putting some kind of, whether it's a bridge or a tunnel or something, in that existing railroad grade, why anyone would propose something that I see to the right, this trail that goes around and across private driveways and across a very busy street. It just, I'm having a hard time getting my head around that. So, uh, yes, Representative Griffin. Um, along with that uh, vein of thinking, earlier one of the speakers said that the uh, Department of Transportation had never had their safety people look at the alternative plan. I wonder if you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, the, the, the plan as proposed has been reviewed. Um, it, it meets ADA compliance. There were some reviews that were done um, on the earlier alignments um, that required modification. Um, and it was, was mentioned earlier that you know we did a review and we didn't like what we saw and so we asked them to modify it to provide more site distance to make improvements to a, a preliminary concept alignment um basically that could uh, prove that we we could meet the grades necessary um to uh have the trail um, go under the bridge shieldsbrook bridge um and it could be accommodated as with anything as we advance designs we fine-tune the design to make sure that um, it meets safety requirements and ada requirements and there might be other things that will be um, modified before the project gets bid out that's just that's the way this this works um and um so so we believe it's a safe design and and um, we wouldn't put it out if we didn't think it didn't wasn't safe. So not to, I'm sorry, um, not to cut you short, but there are a number of people that I think that have traveled from far away, perhaps. Um, and I'd like to get on to our next year. We'll be holding another work session on this bill. As obviously we've been given a lot of information to digest and look at. A lot of questions have been brought up, but. Any of you folks, again, recognizing that we will be holding another work session on this, uh, if you have like five minutes you'd like to offer, and uh, the gentleman in the back, uh, yes, Duncan. sir. 
So, so I'm done. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll schedule another work session. We're over an hour into uh, the next work session. So to be fair to the people that are waiting for that, uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. And if you could please state your name for the record and uh, please try to be brief if you can. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Name here is Dave Topham from Salem. And I have a little background on myself while I'm here today. And... Oh, Topham, T-O-P-H-A-M, like a ham sandwich. <laughs> okay. I'm here today uh, representing the organization called New Hampshire Rail Trails Coalition. But a little personal background on me, why I have a real serious interest in this entire project. I'm a certified bicycling instructor I have been working with DOT as a volunteer for over 40 years. There hasn't been a single project bike ped related from maps, safety brochures, plans, including the design of the Memorial Bridge connecting Portsmouth to Kittery that I have not been involved in, along with others, not just me alone. And the input from the bicycling community for DOT design has been a major factor in safety all the way through, including on the Memorial Bridge, the Belvedere's, the bump outs, that came from us in the bicycling community, talking with DOT and the design phase early on. So again, I just want to fast forward that I've been involved with a lot of things at DOT for many years, including a charter member, what's known as the Complete Streets Advisory Committee, which serves at the pleasure of the commissioner. Okay, this is not federally or state mandated. This is within DOT. I was appalled when I heard and learned October 28th of 21 that this tunnel plan that we had seen repeatedly throughout 2019, a 10-year plan, the gasset hearings, as Mr. Stamler said, it goes around the state, there's some 20-odd meetings, gasset plans are put forward, look at a 10-year plan. We were shown, hey guys, we're putting the tunnel under the new 4A connector room. It's there. It's in print. We saw that. Congratulations. We didn't know until October 28th of 21. Mysteriously, the tunnel's going on. How'd that happen? I was told it's too late now. It's out of the planning stage. It's in design. It's 25% design completed when we first heard about it. What happened to public hearing? Oh, there was a meeting between DOT and a few folks in Derry behind a closed door with the muzzle on, confidentiality cards. They couldn't talk about it. And I'm on the same board as Mark Potters. Okay, what is wrong with this picture? So I went up wearing my safety hat. I went back to the Complete Streets Advisory Committee, basically the chair of it, Bicycle Safety Group within the Bureau of Highway Design, and if I mention names right now, but believe me, I know them very well, I know the building well after 40 years, set 30 feet away from the project manager, same bureau, I said, how could this happen? This is totally unsafe. I mean, a three-year-old, the kids who showed up in the Derry Town Council meetings, they're saying the same thing, they're in wheelchairs. How could we do this? This doesn't make any sense. So I went to the bike safety group. We were not consulted. February of 21, I conducted a Zoom meeting with DOT, including the project manager was there. Why? We don't talk to each other. We work in silos. We worked at value engineering. We are saving money. What happened to the safety? We're not talking about it. I wanted to put it on the agenda for DOT's own Complete Streets Advisory Committee. As a charter member on that committee, it was refused. We cannot talk about it. You cannot talk about it. DOT won't allow me to talk about it publicly in a recorded session with a subset engineering group. DOT shut me down. You cannot talk about it. What is going on? So bottom line, just the point, and again, I value your time. I don't want to ramble on. I've been too involved with this for so long. I could really ramble on for an hour. I won't. But just take the basic concept. If you have... 10, 12 foot wide, this is a 10 foot plan here. But when you it's 12 feet wide, if you have 1,000 to 1,500 people a day on all modes, and we're talking about the overall concept that DOT uses, contact sensitive solutions, designed for the plan, designed for what you're building it for. 
a lot of emphasis. I give DOT credit, Pete Stamnitz and the widening of I-93 projects. You know, well, I went all the way back to the I-93 Transit Investment Study. I was on that committee too. It's great. But when it comes to the bicycle infrastructure and support for it, very, very weak. And honestly, there was no one, either consultants or within DOT or the bike pay community or Federal Highway, who have yet to this day had input for the safety aspects of this, quote, spaghetti crew. None. And that can be confirmed with multiple people. So again, I appreciate your consideration, the funding aspects. I'll also just throw in for the funding very quickly. It's interesting to note that Project Section A, that's the major connector to 93 that's under construction now. We just drove it by today coming up from Salem. That had a $4 million overrun. It was paid for mysteriously. $4 million came about to the overage in the first 48 hours. And here we are talking about 750000 for the cost differential between the current plan, which is totally unsafe, and having the tunnel. 750000 on about a $104, $110 million project. So it doesn't make sense. Again, 80% federal, 20% New Hampshire toll credits is what's funding it. Gary was not asked to do anything. In one quick term, that letter that came down, which we have a copy of from Commissioner Bill Cass, and it was December 14th or 16th, thereabouts, saying that Gary is going to be on the hook, not only for the cost of the tunnel, but to rework the plans. And because of the, the delays, that's going to extrapolate into maybe two to six million dollars of dairy taxpayers say, no, no, we can't go there. I question that rating. Final point on, again, I have to get off the bandwagon here, I know. But still, very quickly, when it comes to the delays, we're very concerned about delays in our young meeting. Yeah, Kathy, we don't want to be in here forever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> Fair enough. Anyway, just for the, the delays, we have not only the delays for the reworking of the, the design plans, preliminary design engineering is now done 65% estimated. To change the plans now, it's been estimated, it might take six to eight months. What hasn't been stated is what is the delay to get the new federal approvals, the environmental impact statements? Environmental protection groups, the floodplain, Army Corps of Engineers, all these people have to weigh in yet. That approval process takes months. And that is what mainly that $5 million from Derry and London Derry, if you look at that contract, that was for the environmental studies primarily. It wasn't for the construction, it was studying the overall project. So take a look at the numbers, see where we are. And again, I feel honestly, DOT and the state shouldn't have to pick up any part of the funding for this. If needed, yes. If not, let's see where that four million came from immediately that went into advanced section A of section of 130565, 1365A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Seeing none, uh, representative in the back, would you like to? Oh, th thank, you, thank you for your time. Oh, sure. Yeah, if you want to just hand them to Mr. Hoffman there, he'll make sure we get a copy. Good afternoon, Good and afternoon. thanks for your patience. If you could state your name. My name is Catherine Prudholm O'Brien. I'm a state representative from Derry. I have a lot to say on this. I have been walking those trails for 30 years. I walk them often. My husband is a disabled veteran, and when he had spinal fusion surgery, walking on the trails was a big part of his recovery. When I recently joined my friend with the uh, re with on recumbent bikes with the VA uh, associate, uh, I'm sorry, the Veterans Administration uh, um, therapy program. They would not. They, they would not be able to use the trail with this spaghettified design, and they were very concerned about grades of say one or two percent over a mile, and they absolutely wouldn't be able to use this. This would be dangerous. This is dangerous for them. It's dangerous for bicyclists in general. It's dangerous for mothers with strollers. I don't like the spaghettified plan, and I remember the first time I heard about it. It was that same meeting that Mr. Topham just spoke of. It was the 1028 
21 meeting at the town, uh, the municipal center in Derry. And when I first saw that plan, I was aghast. I was aghast. And I felt blindsided. And I was very concerned that I had missed something. And I saw it and I said, what the heck is this? And I asked the engineer standing next to the plan, what is this? And he told me that was a crossing at Shield Brook. I am familiar with Shield Brook. It's a very small brook and it floods. And at one point, people had to be um, evacuated in an industrial park near there because of some flooding issues. I, was, I couldn't wrap my head around how they would be putting a crosswalk down there. I was also told over this whole uh, process of trying to figure out what in the world happened and how we got here, I was told I should be fighting, I should have been fighting for the straight passageway a lot sooner and I should have been going to the 10 year plans and, and all those sorts of things in those meetings. Do, I'll tell you something, myself and my community could not wrap our minds around having a crossing at Shield Brook. That was something we didn't fight against because we didn't know we had to fight against it. We couldn't imagine such a crazy plan. I feel duty bound to be here and, and, and express the will of my community. If we put this in, if this is put in, the community is going to be furious when it's done. Okay? I've spoken to disabled people who are very busy. They work all day. They don't have an opportunity like you and me. And, and I know we go to a lot of meetings and we, we talk about this stuff at infinitum. That's kind of a luxury that a lot of people don't have. And I have a disabled friend who will probably we be wheelchair bound soon. And she's aghast and she's mad. And she's asking me, how did we get here? And all I can tell her is I was blindsided too. And every time I try to ask questions, I am getting nowhere. I, I have called, I have lots and lots of notes from every phone call I make. But when I've called safety officials at DOT, nobody seems to know anything about this. They don't know about it. Nobody knows. D DES doesn't know about it. There is a beaver dammed pond above this that is not on your, on your map that feeds Shield Brook. And should that break suddenly, I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody has any answers about that. I am a violent crime survivor. And I'll tell you something. That bend is kind of scary. I wouldn't want to go down there. And that is a big, that's a hill. That's a hill. I wouldn't want to go to down to the bottom of the hill and have a bend to go into a bridge, I mean a tunnel, that I can't see. I can't see from a long distance. That would make me very nervous. I wouldn't use it. I live on the road. I live, on, I live in Derry, but the road that I live on goes into Windham. And a previous speaker spoke about the tunnel under Route 93 going under north and southbound lanes of Route 93 that was put in about three years ago. And yes, that's true. There's very few people that use it. A couple people in, in the neighborhood that walk their dogs. If that could have been built for the people in the town of Windham, why can't this straight pass through be built in Derry? That, that tunnel that's in Windham on that old rail trail leads to nowhere. It is invisible. Unless you live in that neighborhood, you don't know where it is. On the side in my neighborhood, I can see it because I know my, my street, and I know where it is, and I know the old rail trail crossing that's unpaved, that's in the town of Windham. On the other side of it, it goes to a private daycare business. There's no signage, and when you are in, when you go to the other side of it, you think that this you're not supposed to be there, that this is a private business, and that you're maybe walking around kids and you're not supposed to be and making people nervous, you wouldn't go there. You would have no way of knowing that there was a tunnel there if you were on the other side of it. So that is why nobody uses it. What I'm asking for is a straight passage through that thousands of people would use every week. Thousands. And I don't think that's too much to ask for. And thank you for your time. I know that this meeting has gone over. Thank you for your testimony. Are you willing to take any questions if there are any? Yes, I hope I can answer them. And if not, I'm sure we can find someone who can. Any questions? Hopefully. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Yes, sir. If you could try to keep it as brief as possible. Again, remembering that we'll have another work session on this bill next week. Pay attention to the calendar that comes out Friday. 
Thank you very much, Chairman and uh, committee members. My name is Mark Samsel. Uh, I'm from Windham. I'm the founder of the Windham Rail Trail Alliance that uh, we started our journey back in 2004. Um, as well, public service, I uh, was a chairman and served on the zoning board uh, for 15 years as well on the uh, Rockingham Planning Commission as well, uh, Southern New Hampshire. Hello, is this better? So oh, the spelling of your last name, please. Oh, Samsel, S-A-M-S-E-L. I'll respect your time. I'm not sure if I can make it next week, so that, that's why I'm asking uh, for a little bit of time. What I'd like to do is read in a uh, letter for the record uh, from the Windham Rail Trail Alliance, and I will just talk briefly to the economic points uh, that are in the study committee. Uh, members of the committee, uh, founded in 2004, the Windham Rail Trail Alliance is dedicated to the development and management of this remarkable 4.6-mile section of abandoned rail bed uh, as a paved rail uh, uh, trail, and this is part of the Granite State Rail Trail, which we're looking forward to completing at uh, some point. Uh, this section, connecting with Darien Salem, uh, offers 12 miles of continuous paved rail trail, the longest in the state. Uh, we also are home to a, a former B&M caboose, the uh, C-16, so we're happy to provide a nice recreational a uh, asset. 2022 is a tremendous year for our rail counts. Um, within a 13-day period, uh, we recorded 5,890 trips and uh, with a daily average of 453. And that use uh, continues uh, and continued through that year. It was a COVID year, so the numbers were high, but right now the numbers are tremendously high as well. Uh, we have a lot of parking issues. Uh, if you look uh, to the north of Derry, their counts uh, are 163,000, and that's in 2020. So, if, you know, logically you can take a peek and say, look at if you look north, look south, these numbers are going to be tremendous in dairy. And there's going to be a tremendous economic uh, development uh, opportunity for them via the rail trail. We strongly believe that the tunnel is the appropriate method uh, to keep the continuity of the trail and the integrity and the safety. I think uh, the folks that have spoken uh, behind me uh, most uh, are in favor of that position as well. And again, in Windham, we continue to um, like to serve as the benchmark. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions for you. Now, real quick, I want to go through the 2020 uh, state rail plan. And that, there'll be a lot of information. I know Mark mentioned it uh, in the handout that I have. I also have the URL. This was completed in August. Uh, that was sponsored and authored by DOT. It's uh, 186 pages. Um, I wasn't uh, encouraged to <laughs> make copies for you, but this is the size of the document. There's a lot of detail there, which I believe uh, you'll be able to uh, look at it and uh, get a lot of uh, snippets and information that's going to be helpful to you. Uh, that uh, rail plan was based on Senate Bill 185, and uh, myself and Bob Rimmall, the president of the London Dairy Trail uh, Alliance, uh, we worked with uh, Senator Stiles and Carson on putting that uh, bill together. Uh, the committee was led by DOT, was authored by DOT, and there were five state agencies uh, representing, uh, and also six statewide organizations were part of that uh, committee. There were many hearings uh, publicly held for the input. The statement of purpose, and I want to read this to you, and I'll be wrapping this up. This, the act requires the development of a plan for the state rail trail system to ensure preservation and integrity of these assets and to provide direction for future development. In addition to defining the role of the Department of Transportation in preservation of rail corridors. The plan will determine the best way to maximize the return on investment, which is why I'm going through this section, and leverage future investment in the state rail corridor assets, and will determine how to engage towns, cities, and private rail trail organizations in these efforts. Now, I can say there was reference to a, to a tunnel that was uh, installed under 93, and that is connected to a town-owned rail corridor, which was abandoned, the state, uh, part of the uh, Worcester Nashua, Nashua in Portland Trail. Uh, town owns it, and we're in the process of developing that. And I can say to the statement of purpose uh, that that was the, you know, that was a future vision, one of these uh, criteria, 
that DOT uh, is uh, tasked with, and that is to look to the future. When the widening of 93 occurred, that was the time to do it. It was a cost-effective time to build that tunnel. Uh, the uh, scope of the study, uh, and when you read that, it'll talk to the inventory, economic impact, funding, econo and uh, prioritization of state investments, improving, managing, and maintenance. And I did um, attach uh, to you, with you, with you, for you, um, summary of the counts in summary of the economic activity, specifically count, uh, showing you the activity between Londonderry and Windham because Derry's smack dab in the middle. Derry's numbers are not in here other than the economic. They did combine it with Windham. Um, that is because the study was only uh, pointed to state-owned corridors. Derry is not state-owned. It's privately, privately owned. And I talk about the uh, criteria, and I won't go through them, those points, the six points. You can read them on your own. Um, and I did include uh, the last three pages are cut and paste of the actual the economic data that comes from that study. And I'd be willing to be back next week if my uh, schedule allows it, but I'll entertain any questions that you may have. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. If you could give a copy of that uh, to Mr. Hoppen, or you have, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll uh, pay attention to next week's house calendar. We'll reschedule this work session for next week. Rep we recess. recess. <clears throat> that being it, we'll see you someday next week. We'll take a short break, a five minute break.
All right, Chairman Weiler, here we go. So we're at an extreme disadvantage because I see a number of the sponsors uh, sitting at the table. Yeah. Senator Weiler, a, a senator. Uh, <laughs> I just did, I just, he said that last week. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm just getting even. <laughs> Representative Weiler, anything you'd like to add or Representative Evil, I see you, your name on the bill. It is badly needed. In uh, 1976, they built a parking garage and they said it's a 25 year life. So in 1992, we bought the building when it was up for sale from the bank. And in 2005, we hired a, um, and he's passing out pictures that came from that 2005, we had a study to, and it also included what was then and up another lot up for sale across the street from the police station, which has since been sold and a new building's gone on it. So the more we delay, the worse it gets. At least we're not talking about taking most of the space, most of the space for the Department of Justice, which the last um, session, we moved them, we moved the Department of Justice to, a, to another building about a mile away. So they, at the time, the parking garage became an expansion of the Department of Justice, which I didn't think was right, but they everybody got to the architect, the city of Concord and the and the bank and everybody and DOJ and yet they called it the parking garage, this legislative parking garage, which I was a little bit miffed at. But anyway, I'm delighted to have this bill moving along and I hope we pass it. Thank you. Any questions for Representative Weiler? This uh, document that I just handed out, Legislative Parking Garage, Representative Weiler actually provided this to me yesterday, so he's been right on top of this for a couple of decades. Yeah. So, How much yeah. did it cost per unit? <laughs> it was going to be $33,000 per car. Yeah, that that's not bad. That, yeah, that's not bad at all. No. Don't forget you have to use your mics, guys. A representative of Cambrils. Yes, so I'm just, uh, I looked at the front page here. The um, 806 to 876 projected spaces, who, who would be allowed to use those spaces uh, aside from the legislature? Uh, state employees, and at the time, they were just going to enlarge DOJ, which is in this building presently, they were going to enlarge the building 20% specially for them. So the DOJ would have spaces, and there were 15 spaces for the bank, which was considered to still exist. And then there were so many spaces for legislators and employees of the legislature. And it also included a space across the street, which we could have bought and didn't. Someone else has bought it and put a new building on it. So that's, even though you'll see it in the plan, it's not part of the this Further point. question? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so would uh, would the amount of spaces available accommodate all the legislature, the Department of Justice needs, um, and any other uh, governmental agencies that may, may be nearby that need to use it? In that plan, yes. And it also was expected to be used when we're not here, which is almost six months of the year, by the city of Concord. City of Concord wanted to be able to have the free use of it when we weren't needing it. Representative Ebel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Yes, I am also um, a co-sponsor of this bill. I feel like I've been living the legislative parking garage, not quite as long as Representative Weiler, but for quite a while. Um, because I was on public works and we had to keep reassessing the situation with stores, how much money to put into it. Um, I think we've been throwing good money after bad over there for a really long time. And we really need to move ahead with this. Um, so obviously I support it. I guess 
this bill says it's going to be a general fund appropriation. My from the facilities committee and from looking at uh, information in the legislative budget, and unfortunately there's nobody here to talk about it. I mean, there are millions of dollars in the legislative budget. And so I'm wondering why there's not some con there couldn't be some contribution where general fund dollars are short from the legislative budget. Um, so that was a question, actually. I was going to ask a little bit more about what we have in the legislative budget. I mean, I don't want to uh, overstate the case. I thought it was something like $10 million we have. Probably so. closer to two or three. Oh, okay. Well, then I overstated. But, you know, you're right. We have been carrying surpluses from year to year in the legislative budget. Not everybody gets to see it. The fiscal committee quite often gets it put in front of us at our deliberations on a regular basis. But we usually carry a surplus from year to year. Uh, a lot of it went for these front steps recently, but finally there's a little more in it now. So yes, we could possibly say $2 million is coming from the House side. I know the Senate wouldn't approve it because they already have all the spaces. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, maybe we could just um, look a little bit more closely at the legislative budget and see what we think is a is a appropriate amount there and then the only other thing i would say is that coming from um, a public works background again when there are capital projects of this sort there is some sort of oversight from the capital budget overview committee i mean they sort of check in yep. um, on the project on its design progress just to see, and, and I wasn't sure in a bill that's a capital project that's coming through the Finance Committee what sort of oversight there was going to be for a big project like this. So that was another question. And I, honestly, I don't, I don't know the process here, so I don't know when to really discuss these things. And then the last thing I would say is I, you know, DAS is in here. I'm not exactly clear on the interface between DAS and the management of a project of this magnitude and and the and the legislature I know we have the facilities committee um, as well but this is a very large amount of money so those are my thoughts and maybe that's the type of thing that if we make a recommendation here that can be talked more about at the finance committee at the full committee level I I just don't know yeah I was hoping to have Commissioner Arlinghouse here um, and Terry Paff but maybe they were here earlier they could have answered some of your questions but you're certainly um, allowed to submit an amendment to us once we find out what's in the legislative account terry pav could have told us that right off the top of his head we can also include some uh, a recommendation of oversight whether it's whoever you suggest uh, because what we do here uh, is make a recommendation of the full committee through an amendment process so if you wanted to add $2 million, say, to this and reduce it down to $23 million of general funds. You could do that in an amendment, and then we'd present it to the full committee. So you're welcome to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I guess if they were here, I would ask them where the $25 million amount came from, ask about the plan. I mean, those are all sorts of specifics that we usually inquire about on a capital project um, of this nature. And I guess I would also ask the status of the almost $10 million that we invested previously on on moving DOJ over mm. to the granite whatever building. So sorry, I know I'm a co-sponsor of this bill, but I did have a lot of questions. Well, that's all right. It's not a problem. Like I said earlier, it's always good to ask questions. So we, we can recess this to a day next week. Um, we'll put this first on our agenda as far as 
bill hearings and then deal with the uh, tunnel after that. But I'm not sure of the date yet without looking. But if you want to get together, Representative Ebel with uh, the commissioner and Terry Path to work out language that you're happy with, that would be great. Um, we also have a facilities committee meeting coming up. It may be tomorrow or the next day. I forget. Um, so maybe there'll be more discussion there. All right. Great. Thank you. Actually at 830, I think. So I don't. Yeah. Further. Yes, Representative. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I had one more question for Chairman Weiler. Um, you mentioned earlier that in the off sessions that the city of Concord would be using the garage. Would it ever be just a question for my constituents? Would it ever be open to the public to be used for its free parking space or, or does that ever happen? Yes. I think that was part of the, the, if Concord had one of these street fairs, like they frequently have, they would want to use it for that. And so, you know, that was one of the reasons they, they'd say, yes, we want to be able to have the use of it. And, you know, we, leave the gate up or whatever whatever the we had for that so yeah and as a follow-up to your question one of the things that um, we heard i think last week was that all the parking spaces that are taken like on park street and around the state house and the lob would no longer be occupied by legislators giving the public more access to these buildings so. and more revenue for concord right well, before Representative McGuire has any questions, we'll recon. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, we'll uh, keep an eye to the calendar and we'll be back next week. Thanks, Karen.